of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, January 12th, 2023 at 6.04 p.m. A quorum of the board is physically present at the AISD central office to conduct this meeting. Board meetings are open to the public based on space availability to ensure social distancing and the health and safety of our community and staff. <clears throat> this meeting is, being streaming, is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV. It is also being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum, Astound Broadband, and on channel 99 through AT&T UVerse. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. To our audience tuning in remotely and here in person, welcome and thank you for joining us. We'll move to the approval of the agenda. Trustee Kaufman, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. I'm sorry, Sapata got you first. <laughs> Having a motion by Trustee Kaufman and a second by Trustee Sapata to approve the agenda. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Great, the motion passes unanimously by all those on the dais. All right, Trustee Kaufman, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas Flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Puro lealtad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Ono a la bandera de Texas, te juro lealtad Texas, un estado bajo Dios, único e indivisible. Thank you. All right, next is an opportunity for the public to share comments with the board. This time allows speakers to comment publicly on any topic of their choosing. We have time for up to 60 speakers. As a reminder, the district continues to provide time during the regular voting meetings of the board to hear from the public about agenda items for consideration and vote. This is an opportunity for the board to take part in active listening. While we wish we could respond or provide feedback, we are required to limit our questions to requests for a clarification or follow up directly to the administration. Members of the public wishing to participate uh, in the public comment portion of our meeting called a dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to audio record their remarks. Um, we will now play the recorded messages for public comment, so please listen carefully. This is Sharon Vain. I'm the parent of a Bowie High School student and a 2022 AISD graduate, calling about agenda item 13.1. I want to laud the district for its work thus far in making its school calendar inclusive of all families. I was thrilled to see the draft plan to offer student holidays on several major non-Christian holidays during the 2023-24 school year, including Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar and one that many families spend all day observing. However, I was saddened to see that Yom Kippur is also the elementary school parent-teacher conference day. I am guessing that the plan is to offer an alternate conference time to Jewish parents of elementary school children. However, this feels at odds with the intent of a district holiday in recognition of Yom Kippur. As it stands, only middle and high school families will truly get the holiday, Jewish elementary school families will have to make special arrangements, and Jewish elementary school teachers will have a real conflict on their hands. I urge you to go back to the drawing board to avoid these impacts, which currently negate the intent of designating Yom Kippur as a student holiday. Thank you. My name is Kuislawa Guerra. I'm a parent in Austin ISD calling about three things, Title I funds, the budget, and elementary essentials redesign. Last year, the district lowered the percentage of low socioeconomic students that a school must have in order to receive Title I funds. The result was that schools with the highest concentration of poverty lost Title I funds, and wealthier and wider schools got even more money. And that's a problem because I don't know how that percentage was determined. Was it done with equity? We are truly taking away more and more from those schools that have less and less, and we need to switch that. Second, for the budget, we need to decentralize our budget. I, all I hear is Austin IC talking about how small, how big recapture is, and how small our budget is. And if that's the case, 
all the salaries and all the financial resources of the school district need to be going to campus-based staff and frontline educators. We need to not only increase the salary and hourly wages of the people who work with children day in and day out, but we need to have more staff at those campuses, and that means decentralizing our budget. Lastly, the elementary essentials redesign is a racist disaster, and everyone on that diet who voted for it needs to fix it. I've got schools in my neighborhood that have two full-time music and art teachers, while the neighboring school doesn't even get one full-time music or art teacher. Fix it. <clears throat> this concludes the public comment. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications? Yes, Trustee Hunter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. I am ashamed to say that I am not sure how the percentage decides whether it goes up or down. Uh, I would be helpful to know uh, why it went down to include more schools. Um, and then I would also like to know, is there a formula? Do we use equity by design or we put numbers in a hat? I mean, I, I really don't know how it happens. And I think it would be beneficial if, if I knew that, but then also our community understood how that number is determined and why it is changed, whether it's up or down, why it's changed. And then um, I'm sure we'll ask about uh, when we get to the calendar part, mm -hmm. we'll get more information about, about that. Uh, the last thing is uh, the caller mentioned um, elementary redesign. Uh, I would ask the uh, interim if we're, um, was there ever a survey done for parents as to what it was doing? Has there been information collected on how it's going for different schools? And uh, if we can get more information on that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Trustee Hunter, more than happy to provide that information. Uh, we can do it in written form. Uh, some of the questions, I think, specifically around the budget and kind of how Title I was uh, calculated last year might be covered through the Q&A as part of the budget uh, presentation later today. But the other two I can take care of via the memorandum. <clears throat> Trustees, any other questions? All right, thank you. All right, our next item is the President's report. And before I get into it, Let's all welcome our new interim superintendent, Matias Segura. Thank you. <laughs> and he told us he had a wonderful week, so. And we will make sure it keeps happening. Let's keep it rolling. We're all here to support you, Matias, so thank you. Thank you. All right, um, our next item is the President's Report, and I wanna highlight one item on tonight's agenda preview, which is new for the district. Uh, the board is considering an item 8.2, an ad hoc special education committee for trustees. This committee would focus on how the district and governance team are best supporting our special education students, systems, and programs. Special education is a priority for this board, and we want to ensure that the board is providing proper oversight and governance of the management of the district as required in the Texas Education Code. In partnership with the interim superintendent, we will discuss this item as a governance team to determine what this could look like and if this is an ad hoc committee needed at this time. If the board wishes to move forward, a vote would occur at the regular voting meeting in two weeks, approving the new ad hoc committee and its purpose. Also, I want to make our community aware of a great event for students, families, and community members next Monday. As a reminder, the district will be closed next Monday in remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy. The Austin area MLK Community March is this Monday, January 16th at 9 a.m., and we really hope you will join AISD students, schools, and community members at the MLK statue on the University of Texas campus. The march will then head to the Texas Capitol and will be followed by a community festival from 11.15 to 3.30 at the Houston Tillotson University campus. Also, we want to wish luck to all the Austin ISD students participating in the MLK Oratory Competition tonight at ACC Eastview with the theme, The Dream, Uniting Together to Make it a Reality. We are all looking forward to hearing those student submissions. Um, next, I'll give a quick legislative update. Uh, during the legislative session, the board would like the opportunity to have regular updates at, um, on the ongoings at the Capitol, the district's work at the Capitol, and our legislative priorities. For at least these next six months, we will include a legislative update as part of each board info session. And um, 
Trustee Boswell is not here at this moment, but because she was at the Capitol today actually <laughs> advocating. So, um, and so when she gets um, here, I know she called, she's a little late because there was an accident on MOPAC, uh, but she'll be able to share a little bit more details on that. In addition, uh, Trustee Lugo will be providing a superintendent transition update as she is uh, heading up the, the subcommittee that is working on the superintendent search firms. So we will now move to our information, reports, and updates. Mr. Segura, would you please introduce the next item? Absolutely, absolutely, would love to. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Holly, our equity officer, to come up and introduce our consultants to provide a presentation over the equity assessment. <laughs> and uh, trustees and interim superintendent Segura. It's a pleasure to be here this evening uh, to introduce to you our vendor who is conducting our district-wide equity assessment. Um, uh, AIR, uh, American Institutes for Research, was selected several months ago to do this work in a very competitive uh, process to identify uh, experien an experienced assessor. And so the Office of Equity has been working with AIR and we are now in the process of transitioning the leadership of uh, this work and the connections with AIR um, to our chiefs. And so tonight, uh, Orrin Murray, who's with us from AIR, all the way from Illinois, got here yesterday and uh, has been navigating Austin traffic and everything else, but is no stranger to Austin as I understand it. Uh, AIR, by the way, has also done some other work with us around our restorative practices. But this evening, Orrin is gonna share information about where we've been so far in the process and to provide you all with an overview and, uh, and to add, uh, for you all to ask any questions about the process as we move forward. And so with that, uh, Dr. Murray, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and, and move us forward. Great. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mics are good, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so good evening. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, have an opportunity to talk to the board about the work that you've entrusted us in. Um, over this particular school year doing this. You know, we are really excited about uh, engaging both with the board, but also with the larger Austin community in engaging in this work. Um, and I you know, have been in Austin off and on for the past 30 years, believe it or not. So I've seen a lot of changes happen uh, in the space um, and I'm you know, really, pleased that we were selected to do and represent this work for you. Um, are you going to drive the slides or? I'm going to let you drive the slides. Oh, right. Change seats or? Brilliant. Let's just change seats. I'll make sure I get the mic on this time so that the folks that are online can hear what's going on. Um, so actually, let's go back. Um, so one of the first things I want to sort of point out um, is who the American Institutes of Research is today. Um, you know, we are an organization that's almost 2,000 people uh, spread across the globe. Um, that is reasonably new. You know, we were just US-based. We have now expanded to be in places like Africa um, and in um, Southeast Asia um, and Europe. So we have a global presence and we do work uh, across a number of different sort of social services spaces, which include health and human services kinds of things, but also um, education work. Um, our mission is to generate and use rigorous evidence that 
contributes to a better and more equitable world, hence our worldview um, at this place. And it's really important, I think, to point out that our mission isn't just a statement. Um, we do this work and we take resources that we have and engage in this work. Um, so last year, we engaged in a $100 million, 500-year effort, five-year, not 500, five. <laughs> Uh, five-year effort to fund research on equity that isn't being funded by other people. We are doing that with our own employees, but we are also doing that with people outside of our institution. And so there are people who are you know, competing for some of this funding, uh, which we have essentially, as a nonprofit, raised ourselves and are putting back into the space. Um, and so, you know, we're really excited about this work um, and engaged in it. So let me tell you a little bit about the team uh, that we have that are working with you. So Femi Vance um, is the project co-director. Uh, Trent Sharp also is a co-director on this, and some of you may know Trent Sharp you know, and different iterations. Um, Tia Clinton is our qualitative lead. My role on this project is as a quality assurance and senior advisor, given the work that I've done on the culturally responsive and restorative practices, a grant program, but also other programs that I've had. Uh, Sharice Hollingsworth is our steering committee's lead. Uh, Nora Gannon Slater is our quantitative lead. Um, uh, Melissa Chavaria is our project manager, and then Izzy Lick is a researcher. And so these are some of the people that we have that are working on this project uh, for you. Part of my goal here today, or this evening with you, is to develop a shared understanding of the pro purpose and the process of this assessment. We have done this kind of work in places throughout the country um, and, you know, and tend on doing it in other places going forward. Um, I also want to engage in a question and answer feedback and recommendations from the board. It is critical that you are involved in this and not just as a recipient of what's going on because it is of strategic importance to the district. And the work that we've done with districts around the country, it's important to have leadership connected to this work. And given what's been happening with leadership in AISD over the last year or so, we want to make sure that there is a consistent connection to the leadership in this work. So our approach in this, um, and if you have been involved in uh, the selection of us, you have seen this kind of uh, slide before, but our approach is to build on a research base that says this is how you be mindful about things like inequities in public school districts around the country. Um, this is how you engage in rigorous and you know, uh, robust analysis of data with a community-driven effort that we have branded as co-interpretation, right? And so we are going to collect a bunch of information and we are going to masticate it, which means that we're going to sort of chew it up at a level and then we're going to work to engage the community in that to make sense of it so that the findings, if you will, are owned by the community, are owned by the district. We, when we do this kind of equity work, we don't come in, get your data, and then tell you what we think, because that's the height of hubris. We wanna get the data, use the things that we are good at, which is making sense of data, and engage you in a process to Take the context that you know, that your community knows about what's going on here, and point to things that isn't suppositional, that isn't based on rumor, that isn't based on beliefs, but is essentially grounded in data, 
to come up with things like root causes so that we can then, as a collective, move towards how are you going to address this. So that's a process that we've used time and time again when we do this kind of work, and it's been really successful in places that we have done it, where we get buy-in, right? And so that's important. We can't do this ourselves. We need you to be part of, partners with us in this. Obviously, this work is grounded in the context of the school district and in the community, right? And so part of that context is a historical context represented by this map on the left. Some of it is represented by the more recent context of the students at uh, this particular high school image. And then finally, you have had some recent information in the equity action plan that also informs this context, right? And so we do our work within that context. Our charge and objectives uh, is to address how district and campus policies affect students. Um, and, you know, we look at it across a couple of different levels, right? And so we want to look at things like policies uh, that support the recruitment and development and retention of identity diverse candidates, employees. Why? The research says that it's important for students to see people that look like them, that talk like them in leadership positions so that they can develop trust, so they can feel like they can be part of the communities, right? And so it's an important part of uh, belonging. Um, and then also, uh, you know, looking at things like resource allocation and how those things contribute to equity or inequities in the district. And so there's a student outcomes focus, there are educator outcomes focus, and then resource allocation focus. And so those are the three buckets that we will be looking at as we masticate this data to bring to the community to make sense of uh, the pieces. At any point, please interrupt if you have questions. Um, happy to take those and not just have me sort of talk through. Um, so the equity assessment alignment with the long range plan is where this is going. In order for us to do that, we need to be sure that we are connected um, so that we're not just doing this in isolation and dropping something off to you. Not a great idea, right? Uh, and so the plan for right now is in 2023, work to do community engagement activities, begin developing problem statements, and begin to dig into root cause analysis. In the spring, when it gets hot here and warmer in Chicago, we'll be you know, engaging in the community in the long range paneling process through this co-interpretation uh, phase. Uh, and we think that we'll get to a place in the early fall where we can come together with some recommendations after we've gone through this weaving of here's the data, how we've put the stuff together and what people have to say about it. And so that's sort of how we anticipate weaving these pieces together. This is a big picture view of that assessment process, one that we've used time again. So there's typically planning that happens. Um, and we've worked with Dr. Holly's team to begin to do some of the planning work um, in terms of making sure that we have the right questions, making sure that we're thinking about sources of data and where those sources lie within the district that we can get to that we don't have access to in terms of publicly facing things that are in TEA space. We're involved right now in some data collection. Um, we have access to some data. There's more that we need to get to do this work. And again, the analysis, which is not a full on analysis, it's a bit of a mastication, right? And then we'll move into this co-interpretation uh, which is very community involved, um, where root cause analysis work will be done. And it's essentially everyone who's part of that will be helping to craft the findings and recommendations and strategies. So it's not 
AIR telling AISD what's going on. It's AIR and the community engagement folks making findings and recommendations. The implementation and planning component box is something that we have typically done in this work um, and is typically an add-on after this is done. And so that's why it is you know, kind of an unshaded place uh, because we know it's part of the process, but we don't have a framework for it currently and it'll come after this is done. So our methods, the way that we engage in this work fall in you know the set of best or effective practices which is to say it's mixed methods right we'll be doing things like focus groups we'll be looking at extant data or existing data on uh, gaps and achievement and attendance and discipline practices and who's being disciplined etc uh, you know we'll look at financial data in terms of salaries and who those salaries are hitting mostly in the educator space, like classroom teachers, principals. Um, and then we'll also be doing some strategic document reviews. Again, things like what's the policy about discipline and what's on paper and what are the practices which will then flow through the focus groups that we have with principals and teachers. Um, on the local end of things, you know, there's a coordination team that we hope to have key uh, representatives from departments within the district collaborate, collaborate with us throughout this assessment process to ensure that we have this knitting and buying in of what's going on. Um, we have been reaching out to people in the community that are not AISD employees or that are not on the board. In some cases, some new board members we've been reaching out because we find that it's important to think about the larger community because they have a voice in this uh, and we want to ensure that that voice is heard. And so that work will continue to go uh, along and we'll look to you guys um, and also um, the chiefs for recommendations on places that we uh, haven't uncovered in the work that we're doing there. Uh, in particular, we'll, we'll be looking at this notion of the co-interpretation, like who's going to be part of that work. That's going to be an important body that we engage people in. Um, and one of the things that I am really interested in, in the way in which it goes down, is that voices that have not been at the table, we need to make room for them to be at the table, right? So, you know, one example that I've provided in uh, some talks that I was giving about equity just the other day is, you know, people who have been in Austin or in some of these other communities for years for whom the school districts haven't always been, uh, they haven't trusted them, right? They didn't get their high school diploma, but they have children in the district. They may have gotten their high school diploma, but they didn't have a good run at the, what went on. I mean, those are voices that we need to hear why? Because we know that there's a cycle of quote unquote poverty, but also a cycle of low achievement. People who live in the same place and who have children who end up going to the public school and they didn't do well, there's evidence that the chances that those kids aren't going to do well are too high, frankly. And so we need to make sure that those voices are at the table. Right, and so when we talk about things like focus groups for students or parents, we're not looking for the president of the student council. We're not looking for the captain of the football team or the president of the yearbook. We're looking for the kids who just got disciplined. We're looking for more or less average kids, but we're looking for the kids that we wanna ensure are having the kind of access and opportunities that you are here to ensure that they all get. And so we're, we wanna make sure that those voices are heard, including their parents, right? President of PTOs, they have a bullhorn. You hear from them. 
The rest of the folks, we need to figure out in this process how we get them involved. And so we'll be looking to you, we'll be looking to the chiefs, we'll be looking to other community members to make sure that those voices are part of this assessment. We have in mind an internal steering committee to make sure that we are not just thinking about it's actually coming on. It's okay. I want to just make sure that uh, not people hear everything that I'm saying. Um, uh, so it's important to have an internal steering committee to ensure that, you know, as quote unquote outsiders, as a third party, we're not imposing our ideas on this. We're hearing from people within the community that we are uh, assessing. So, you know, Communications about this equity assessment are critical, and that means reaching out in a community to let people know what's going on. Why? So there are no surprises, right? Transparency is your best defense against, oh, wait, is that really what's going on? Well, yeah. Um, you know, we also want to make sure that there's collaboration on data collection uh, and connections and delegation, and that is done through this internal steering committee. And it's also there to help us not fall into potholes or not fall into things that are going to be dragging us away from the things that we want to focus on, which is getting you a report that has involved the community that you can use to do what? Ensure that every student has what they need to be successful and thrive, right? And so. That's what we need in terms of an internal steering committee and what we're looking for. In terms of the timeline, um, strategic planning and implementation support is ongoing. Um, we, as I pointed out earlier, have qualitative and quantitative uh, data collection underway and anticipate that it's going to continue at least through the end of February. The expectation is that we will have done our analysis of the existing quantitative data within the March timeframe so that we can have scheduled some of these other focus groups to test and probe some of the things that we're seeing so that we can then have all of that ready in the spring and summer for this notion of co-interpretation and root cause analysis, right? So you do your quantitative analysis and then you do your probes with the focus groups after that to like, oh, did I, you know, I see these things, like, did I get that right? So that's the run of show, if you will. Um, and that's the timeline, and those are the things that I have to say. I wanna thank you for your time, um, and if there are questions, I am happy to try and answer them if I can, and note them and get back to you with answers if I can't answer them and right off the top of my head. Thank you so much. Um, so trustees, are there any questions or comments? Yes, Trustee Zapata. You mentioned um, creating this uh, internal committee. So is it, is it just being created? Who's gonna be on it? How, how will that be? How will it be created? That is a fabulous question. So the question is, how is this committee going to be created? Um, so we are currently in a transitioning from working closely with Dr. Holly's team to working more closely with the chiefs. And the chiefs and the conversations that we're having with them is how this thing will be created. We can't decide who's on this committee, or let me be blunt. We shouldn't decide who's on this committee. We can give recommendations based on our experience of working with other school districts, who we, you know, the shape of the kind of person, right? So should you have parents on this? Should you have community members on this? Should you have principals on this? Should you have teachers on this? Should you have students on this? Those are the kind of things that we can recommend in terms of how this thing comes together. Um, but we're engaging in that process with the chiefs. Is that uh, responsive? Yes. 
Yes, and yes, and I think uh, the more diverse it is, the better. That it should not be just top people. And hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I just want to make yeah. sure that the community is included in this uh, group that's being crafted. Thank you. Any other trustees? Uh, yes, Trustee Hunter. I actually just have a note of appreciation um, about your diversity and your methods with selecting those students because we know the head of the cheerleader is having a really great opportunity and we know that the, the football team and the person that's ahead of the debate, they're having a fabulous time. They're gonna, this pop, they might be peaking as a matter of fact, right? <laughs> but we know that maybe that kid that's you know, getting sent to ISS and so we really do want to hear from them because that is, what do they need to be successful? What do they need? And I really, um, I can appreciate that. And um, listening to different parents, because of course I was one of those parents with the bullhorn, right? So I, I get hearing those voices of the parent that's just like, gonna vote with their feet. They're just gonna leave, right? And so um, I think that that will help us get to the truth, because um, we get to hear a lot of positive, beautiful things, and sometimes the ugly things kind of make us feel bad, but that's how we do better, right? So that's just a note of appreciation for your, your methodology in, in getting that data. Thank you. Yes, Trustee Boswell. Hi, thank you for this. I apologize for arriving late and appreciate hearing about it. Um, I have a question. We have an immense number of things that our community needs to engage with coming up this spring, as I'm sure you know, not only this work, but our superintendent search, our budgeting, um, our legislature meets for a few months every two years. That's happening right now. There's a very long list um, that we really want and need our community to engage with. And I think I have a question for you in your work and also just a, a longer question for the administration and my colleagues on the board is just, um, I would love your thoughts as we move forward, you know, kind of in this moment and as we move forward about how we have meaningful engagement that continues to bring people in without exhausting people and that, that really conveys clearly all the different purposes that we're doing. So it, it stays clear and not money, but also kind of as a unified whole that we're working towards something together with all of this engagement. So I welcome thoughts now and, and just partnership going forward. Uh, and thank you for that comment because um, this work that AIR is engaged in right now has been slowed down because our office encouraged and advised in the fall because we had LRP, we had bond, and we're probably always going to have something. Um, so we, we've had lots of conversations about the fatigue that sets in especially. And I think that's where we got to that point where let us move on to folks that are not always heard from, as, as, uh, as Dr. Murray just talked about. And so as we're planning to go into the community and uh, do this work, we are, we're also looking at our immigrant community as well, right? Those are voices we don't always hear. So the hope is with some really good planning with the chiefs that we will have voices that will not be fatigued. It may be um, fresh fresh perspectives to support this. But we do re recognize it is delicate work because our community has been involved in a lot of, uh, a lot of engagement recently. So hopefully fresh voices. Thank you. Hope we find that with all these things we're doing. So thank you. Yeah, I, so let me also add that, you know, from a perspective of someone who's doing work across the country in school districts, myself, Every educator, every family who has a student in public school, for the most part, is exhausted over the last couple of years. I mean, you know, we do a lot of research and evaluation work and recruiting teachers to participate. It was hard pre-pandemic. It has gotten nearly impossible at this point, right? And so some of what we are doing is trying to be, number one, mindful of the asks that we are making to people, being incredibly clear about the expectations that we anticipate in terms of the amount of time that this is going to take, um, and not looking for the usual suspects, right? And so those things allow us to navigate a little bit within a system that is 
really, really overly stressed. Um, and so we are sensitive to that. And we will, as Dr. Holly has pointed out, you know, we've had these conversations about like, yeah, there's a lot going on here. Superintendent searches, uh, bond measures. It's like, we would love for this to track the way the contract said it would track. But the reality, of course, is that that's not how it was working. So let's pause the places that we can pause. Let's keep working at a slower place in the pace of places that we can. And again, be transparent about this, right? So not hide the football and say, oh yeah, yeah, we're doing that. And we're not because we've decided that we can't. We need to be transparent. And we also need to work with you to understand how this fits in your strategic vision so that as you're making choices about how time is spent, mm -hmm. it's spent well. So I hope that's responsive. It is very helpful, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Trustee Kaufman. I'll just make a brief statement. I, good to see you, Mr. Murray, and Dr. Murray, and thank you, um, Dr. Holly and Dr. Murray, for leading this work forward. Uh, I am a new trustee, but I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues on the board when I say that we are fully supportive of this very important work going forward. I'm very happy to hear that the chiefs will be involved you know, with moving this work and um, kind of want to commit to our district staff that if there's anything this board can do to help move the work forward and prevent any of the further delays, um, you know, please let us know. Um, and Mr. Segura as well, so just please let us know that we are really want to ensure that um, that no further time passes without this work happening, even amidst these busy schedules. So thank you so much. Um, any other trustees have comments? Yes, Trustee Foster. So thanks for this and for your um, presence here halfway across the country, and, and thanks for your team, which I know no barbecue. folks are scattered. Barbecue. It's cool about barbecue. <laughs> um, the, uh, and I'm, I'm excited about the mixed methods. And I really like Trustee Boswell's sort of question around um, like how, how do we engage as many, you know, many people robustly without the fatigue? Um, I love your answer about, and Dr. Holly's answer about, you know, really there's folks who they have fatigue, but their fatigue looks a little bit different. It's not because they're over at the ledge or they're over, you know, captaining whatever, but they're dealing with family, you know, just life. Um, but they're not the ones that are tapped. And, and I hear loud and clear that that's part of what you're going for. One thing, and I really don't want to get into the weeds of, of, of y'all's work, um, and yet I always see and perceive opportunity when, when you have this type of work and this type of work done well. There's actually opportunities for engagement that uh, coincide really nicely with student learning and with it, what the teacher's trying to do in a classroom and with what's going on in a campus. Um, and I don't know what the relationships are like campus to campus and how you all are engaging the focus groups and what time of day they take place and that sort of thing and what the buy-in is like up and down the line. But if there is buy-in and an understanding that this is going to move us forward, that perhaps creates a space of opportunity. And I would love to hear about some experiential learning, some action work where what's happening is you have high school students whose participation goes beyond being asked, but they're actually part of the leadership, part of the process. And I think you will get really robust findings, but you also can contribute to our students' outcomes as a collateral, as a, as a side outcome. Does, it, does that make sense 100%, at all? 100%, yeah. So, you know, as a, as a education researcher, you know, one of the, and, you know, I spent a number of years as a faculty member at Penn State. One of the things that I tell people is that, like, you know, when I give you a survey or when I engage you in a focus group and it looks like I'm, quote, unquote, extracting some findings or data from this, that part is somewhat true, right? Because I am getting stuff, but I'm also giving stuff. And when I give you a survey about school climate, or when I give you a survey about, you know, um, 
how things are going in your classroom, that is making you think about, oh, should I, I should be mindful about school climate. I should be mindful about what's going on in my classroom. And so when we engage people in some of the data collection methods, the human data collection methods that we do, there is a halo effect associated with like, oh, you know what? Someone at a minimum cares about the answers that are going on here. I now am beginning to think more about these kind of questions. And that thinking may only last 10 minutes after, or it may go a couple days after, right? And the extent to which we can uh, work with educators in schools to leverage some of the, you know, that sort of the ripple effect of asking these kind of questions. I'm happy to engage with educators in those buildings to, to do that kind of work, right? Because this is not knocking on a wall to see how hollow it is on the other side and not expecting anything except the vibrations. This is about asking people about what their experiences are and turning on lights that people care about what those experiences are. So now let's follow through on those experiences. And so I am, I love the fact that you are interested in that and you know what, let's figure out a way to build that into the schools and the spaces that we do. And I, you know, the other piece of this is that I'll say is that, you know, as we've had some community-based conversations, like one of the early things that we're hearing is like, oh, here you go again. We've heard this before. How do I know? How do I trust? Right? And look, truth of the matter is, you know, whether when you're engaged in municipal kind of work, that is a natural reaction because, number one, there is limited time and resources for municipalities to focus on things, and yet they need to ask the questions. However, I think that there's an opportunity through the way in which we at doing the co-interpretation through in which the way we are focused on communicating and being transparent about this to make it more than just you asked, I heard nothing from that ask, right? It's like there is this process where I'm asking a community member about this stuff, and then we're being transparent, and we are working to develop communication protocols to say, like, this is what's going on with this assessment. Will the results be ones that line up with the way this pastor or that community-based organization wants? I don't know. That's a future question. I don't know what it's going to look like, but we need to at least allow people to know that this isn't something that's being cooked up in a back room by you know, an organization that's based its headquarters in Crystal City, Virginia, because that's not what this is. Okay, thank you. Any other trustees? Did Trustee. Dr. Holly have a... Um, oh, Trustee sorry. Foster, I also wanted to share that um, AIR will be presenting to our principals next week, so that's that may be a great opportunity to uh, to have those some of those conversations about the student engagement and the academic piece. So um, we're they're presenting to a number of different groups um, before this is over, and hopefully we can get to that piece. Well, that, that's concrete, and I, and I like that, and I think that's really an opportunity. So I mean, to the spirit of all the conversations we've been having lately. So what does it look like for a principal to buy in? So this isn't imposed upon a principal, but if you think about what a principal is trying to do as they are faithful stewards of their campus, they have interests and needs, many of which will align nicely. So how do you think about the work in a way that invites the principal in to say, you know what, if you do it this way, here's what can happen for my social studies team that 
will actually get your social studies team excited about it, which will get the kids excited about it, which will accelerate their learning, which will also get you better results in terms of them being willing to you know, really freely share. So I guess I'm in, inviting you into what you say you're all about in terms of this collaborative ethos and this listening ethos, turning the listening into action. Thank you. Any other trustees? So, um, thank you. I have a couple of comments. First, um, I've, I'm just so excited about this work. Thank you, Dr. Hawley, um, for for bringing AIR to the table. This has been something that's been we've been talking about for at least two years in the district, <laughs> um, and so it's so excited. And we have um, I have full faith in in Dr. Hawley you know, leading this effort. As you know, we just used a very, I would say, bold um, approach to designing our bond that just passed. So I have so much faith in this process because we we just have a proof of concept, like a, a $2.44 billion proof of concept um, that when, when we kind of sit back and let the community voice rise up, um, good things happen. And to sort of echo what um, Vice President Foster was saying is, I would say from from Mr. Segura onwards and Catherine Whitley Chu on the end, we're all professional educators. So we're gonna be looking at, not to say that y'all don't matter, sorry, <laughs> but, but a lot of the voice that, um, that I think our board, all of us are gonna be looking to is, is the teacher voice in this. So when I see staff and teachers, it says teachers slash staff, I think of it as teachers comma staff, like teachers as their own important group because they're the ones that are there with our students every day. And, um, and that, that, is a, that is a voice that we don't always get to hear from because meetings happen when, guess what, teachers are teaching. <laughs> so um, I really look forward to that. And the, the bullet that stands out for me the most is the district um, fiscal data analysis. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we have an amazing CFO and I think there's gonna be a lot of like cross sharing of findings as we all do our community engagement around this. So thank you so much for the time and I hope it's warmer here than it is in Chicago right now. <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Segura, would you please introduce the next item? For our item, we will have Chief Financial Officer Ed Ramos, Chief Human Capital Officer Brandy Hosack, and Assistant Superintendent of Financial Services Katrina Montgomery, and they'll take us through the budget update. Uh, before we get going, however, I do want to kind of um, provide a, a little bit of table setting. I, I want you all to um, have the opportunity to provide y'all's priorities as we move through this process. That's what this space is for. You know, we have a process that's going to take us all the way through June, and we have to figure out as a group, you know, where the priorities are so that we can set those larger items and then build a competitive budget around it. You know, our goal is to produce a compensation package that's aggressive. We want to make sure that we support our staff to the best of our abilities and then align our priorities from the work that we learned through the long-range planning process, from input from the community, as well as input from the board. So just wanted to kind of share that with you all. So as we go through this, you know, that's the type of feedback that would really help us move this work forward. So with that, Ed. All right. President Singh, uh, Interim Superintendent Sewuda, uh, members of the board, uh, tonight, uh, we will have the opportunity to have preliminary discussions on the 23-24 uh, budget. And so uh, keep it in mind, this is the first conversation uh, that we will have with our school board. Uh, this is the first step in beginning to build our priorities, uh, beginning to listen to the community, uh, committees throughout the district, our uh, stakeholders, and our staff. And so we are uh, excited to move forward with this process. Uh, with me tonight, I have uh, Brandy Hozek, Chief Human Capital Officer, and Katrina Montgomery, uh, my Assistant Superintendent of Financial Services. Hello. So the first slide that you can see is it on? Do you all see that? No. How about 
there. So the slide that we're looking here is when we're creating a balanced budget and we're working on the balanced budget for FY23-24, you can see quite a few items that are in bold and have larger text. And these are things that we talk about in our community engagements as well as our um, our, our committee or our office, and we talk about property tax, staff salaries, utilities, attendance, and those are some of the, the, the larger items that we discuss. But there are other items on here like transportation, multilingual, school safety, and one of the biggest things we can't talk about our budget without talking about recapture. As we know that recapture, we're the largest paying school district in the state of Texas. Next slide, please. The next slide here talks about our strategic plan, priority, and scorecard goals. So the strategic plan framework was created and set for 2020 through 2025, and it's based on AISD's mission, vision, and values. And of that framework, there are four priority focus areas, and those focus areas are student well-being and achievement, teacher and employee well-being, culture of respect and customer service, Fiscal stewardship and prioritization. And that's the box that I'm gonna talk with you about this afternoon. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, it's kind of small, but it's the Austin ISD scorecard. And there's a box that's highlight, highlighted in green, and that's our actual 21-22 results. If you go over one box to the right, it's the goal for 21-22, and our goal was a 90, a superior rating of which we writ, of reach of which we reached. There is a AAA credit rating score of which, of which we were successful at. And then 81% and we received 81.6% um, will to increase our student share within the AISD boundaries of students who choose AISD. The next slide is the first rating slide. So we've talked about this a little bit before. The, the first stands for Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas. And what it is is where Texas public schools are held accountable for the quality of our financial management practices as well as if we're improving our practices. Some of the items that are reviewed or assessed in this first rating are audit submission, fund balance, cash on hand, current assets and current liabilities, as well as administrative cost ratio. So the, the table off to the far right, we're gonna talk about four sections. It's the rating year, the fiscal year, the rating received, and the district score. So if you go all the way down to the bottom, we're gonna look at year 20, 2022. The fiscal year is FY 2021. And Austin ISD received an A, which is a superior achievement, and our district score was a 90. Next slide. So administrative cost ratio. The TEA standard for the administrative cost ratio is 0 .0855. And if you look down at the chart, you see there are three years, 2020, 21, 21, 22, and then the current 22, 23 budget. Our administrative cost ratios are higher than the TEA standard. And so that's also in the um, chart at the bottom. It shows the difference between the administrative cost versus instructional, the ratio, the standard, and a few years before, in 2018, 2019, and 2019 and 20, we were below the ratio. And then the final three years, we've been above the ratio. So let's talk about what is an, administ what is an administrative cost. So these are costs associated to support and manage curricular programs, district-wide systems, operations, and financial stewardship. These costs are typically not on a campus level. So the pie chart to the left side says the FY23 breakdown by account type. And so the pie chart, the largest part that we'll see is payroll costs, which is 80.1%. Then you have other operating, which is 3.9%. You have supplies and materials, which is 4.5%. And then you have contracted services, which is 115 
So the payroll cost, which is 80.1%, also we have on the next on the next box where it says FY 2023 payroll costs by chief division. And if you look there, the highest um, payroll cost for administrative costs is under the chief of academics, and the lowest one is under the chief of technology officer. I'll turn it back over to Mr. Ramos. Uh, over the next several slides, we're going to discuss specific uh, expenditure areas, uh, program intent areas that we uh, have spent as a district, uh, starting with special education. Uh, so on uh, these uh, graphs, the red uh, bar is the budgeted amount that we budgeted as a district. The gray bar is the actual expenditure that we uh, finished the uh, fiscal year uh, overall in spending. And then the blue line is what we are required uh, or what we are funded by the state based on our PEAMS and our student uh, enrollment. And so uh, depending on the category uh, of the student uh, and the uh, funding uh, for each of these expenditure areas, we are funded uh, at a certain level by the state. Uh, that is the blue line. And then the required uh, expenditures that we must spend as a district by law is the uh, yellow, uh, the orange line. And so looking at special ed expenditures, you see uh, over the years where we've been, uh, last fiscal year, uh, we budgeted 124 million. Uh, we ended up with uh, spending just a little over 100 million. Uh, this year in special ed expenditures, we budgeted 128.4 million. So as a district, we do uh, invest in our special ed students uh, by almost uh, two, 200 percent of our required spending. So again, uh, required spending is that uh, orange line, and we uh, are uh, uh, we are on target to spend about 200 percent of that threshold. With bilingual education, you also see uh, our historical expenditures. Uh, the state uh, allotment that we earned uh, back in 2022 is that uh, blue line, uh, the required expenditures that we must uh, make as a district, again, the orange line. So we were a little under in fiscal year 21-22. Uh, we have budgeted 6.9 million for fiscal year 22-23. Uh, there are going to be several expenditure areas uh, that we did not meet our uh, spending threshold. Uh, we looked at uh, the reason for that. Uh, including bilingual, uh, much of that uh, was because of staff vacancies. So as uh, teachers left uh, the district, uh, there was uh, a time period that it took for us to hire or we could not hire at all. Uh, also, uh, we do, uh, this expenditure does cover uh, specifically uh, staff, classroom staff that is certified uh, with bi the, the bilingual designation. And so uh, with a fewer number uh, this year, uh, as opposed to last year, that expenditure uh, did go down. College career readiness, uh, we see uh, that we uh, budgeted uh, $3.2 million uh, this year, which is what we uh, had earned uh, last uh, fiscal year. And so we are on target uh, to uh, meet that expenditure, and that uh, allotment actually continues to increase year after year. So as a district, uh, we, do, we are doing uh, an exceptional job in making sure we maximize uh, our college career uh, military readiness funding uh, for the district. Career and technical education, uh, the uh, blue line is the uh, state allotment. The uh, orange line, again, what we are required to spend. Uh, last year, uh, we spent a little over uh, close to $15 million in 21-22. In 22-23, you see a large uh, decline. Those are not actual expenditures. Uh, one of the things that changed this uh, budget year is that all campuses, uh, both middle school and high schools, uh, when they receive their staffing allocations, it's coded as an instructional uh, expenditure. And so it's not until later on in the year when campuses finalize their master schedules, when teachers know uh, if they are going to be teaching career and technical education classes, uh, which periods they're teaching them, then we go back and reclassify uh, their salaries. And so uh, once we make a budget amendment with those corrections, uh, you will see that uh, expenditure increase. So uh, it is a preliminary. We knew it was going to look uh, low. Uh, but again, once we make the adjustments, we should be uh, on target with career and tech expenditures. 
Special areas, uh, we had a, a caller uh, a call in about this area. So basically, again, looking at PE music, visual art, uh, and uh, teacher assistance, uh, the uh, change in, in the special areas, uh, uh, just to give the board an idea of where uh, we stood with that change, uh, that was an additional cost of $7.6 million. And so that uh, we just wanted to make sure that the board uh, was aware of what that program is costing the district. One of the areas that we're continually looking at as a district is comparing ourselves to the, our surrounding neighbors. And so as you know, uh, hiring teachers and, and keeping them in the district is, is a challenge, uh, not only for Austin ISD, but for districts across the state. So one of the areas that we see is teachers leaving the profession uh, or uh, us finding uh, difficulties uh, in hiring new teachers when vacancy, vacancies occur. So teacher salaries, as Trustee Singh said, uh, teachers are uh, very important in this district. It's important for us to recognize that we must uh, maintain competitive salaries uh, with our teachers. So when you look at the red line, that is Austin ISD, and that includes our PPFT program. And so one of the things that you notice is our zero to five year teachers uh, are competitive, uh, but once you get uh, to our experienced teachers, 10 uh, to 20 year teachers, we begin to fall uh, at, into the average or below average level. So we know that we uh, have to look at that. We, we are looking at potential adjustments as part of these budget discussions. Uh, the purple line that you see at the top, that is Hayes uh, uh, Consolidated Independent School District. They made a very aggressive move last year. Uh, our intent is to catch uh, uh, that district within the next two years and actually be the highest paying district in Central Texas within the next two years. So uh, we are uh, going to be discussing uh, compensation as a priority. Uh, to us, we feel it is the number one priority just because of what we see not only within our teacher groups, but uh, our classified employees and, and employees throughout the district. So as they are uh, or they do leave the district, it is becoming very difficult uh, to fill these vacancies. And so we know that we have to address uh, compensation, not only because of the difficulty in rehiring uh, employees, but because of the high cost of living in the Austin area. So that will be uh, a priority uh, in, in these discussions that you will continually hear over the next several months. We also, uh, the board was interested in looking at a list of contracts uh, in the district where we contract with vendors uh, over $100,000. And so before you, you see some of the uh, uh, higher contracts uh, that we uh, have within the district, uh, Ascension Seton, uh, 7.7 .7 million, uh, uh, Travis Central Appraisal District. Uh, this is a contract that we must uh, continually pay so that we receive our appraisal values, uh, 3.1 million. Uh, Gramercy Specialty uh, Clinic, 2.1 million. Uh, and if you click on that link uh, that is on uh, the presentation, you will see a complete list of all contracts uh, over $100,000 in the district. Our intent is also to make sure that we receive as much uh, community input uh, as we can as a district. We wanna be transparent with this process. Uh, and so there are several groups uh, that we have identified that we wanna make sure that we have conversations with regarding our budget. Uh, these groups uh, do have discussions within themselves uh, in their committee meetings. Uh, there's a group that's been meeting for over a year, the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, that will present uh, their final goals to the district. And so we wanna make sure that we incorporate the hard work that these committees have uh, already undertaken and, and listen to uh, the priorities that they may have as a district. So uh, we are looking at setting up meetings uh, with our district advisory council uh, looking and hearing uh, the long range planning committee goals uh, that they will uh, present to the district within the next two weeks. Uh, the Austin Council of PTAs, uh, our CACs, Campus Advisory Councils, uh, Education Austin, uh, the Austin Alliance for uh, uh, School Funding Equity, Equity Action Committee, and the Austin ISD Board of Trustees uh, will be an, uh, an important uh, a factor in making sure that we prioritize our expenditures in the district and of course our district staff. And so uh, the goal is to encompass as uh, much as we can uh, as far as information and, and input uh, from all stakeholders in the district. And so we actually uh, have a tool in place that we um, are hoping to uh, bring forward uh, at the board retreat uh, that really uh, will assist us in gathering uh, data quickly 
uh, and identifying and giving us immediate uh, feedback on what are these uh, priorities that these committees may have. So uh, in the past, we've asked for those uh, requests. Those have been emailed to us or, or done through a survey. Uh, we have a tool now that will immediately give us feedback instantaneously. So uh, we are hoping to roll that out uh, at the retreat so you can uh, experience that for yourselves. We have preliminary priorities. This, uh, and, and going back to the uh, community groups, that list will continue to grow as we identify other groups uh, that we would like to uh, have conversations with. So uh, this is a working document. Uh, we have uh, actually had a community meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the uh, requests was if, if I'm a community member and I miss a meeting, how can I make sure that my voice is heard or that I hear the presentation? Because one of the things that I did mention is this: these presentations will be continually changing as we receive input and more data from the community. So we are in the process of creating a, a web page similar to what we did with the 2022 bond where a community member can go just to that one page and see all of the information and the work uh, that we are accomplishing as a district. Uh, so we do have uh, preliminary budget priorities that we have received. Uh, again, compensation within the financial division, that is uh, one area that we are uh, looking at with uh, human capital. Uh, we're looking at a balanced budget and seeing uh, if we can accomplish that uh, for the next fiscal year. Uh, our Board of Trustees, you all have uh, sent us preliminary uh, budget priorities. We just received uh, additional priorities uh, this week, and you all may uh, speak of those uh, tonight as well. Uh, teacher staff compensation is a priority uh, that we have uh, as a board. Uh, special education, multilingual, and mental health are some of the priorities that we have received from our board. Uh, District Advisory Council, we did meet with them October 18th. Uh, some of the preliminary priorities that they gave us was uh, looking at teacher staff compensation, special education, mental health, and multilingual uh, expenditures. So we have a preliminary schedules uh, that are on our website uh, where we will be presenting uh, on our budget, budget priorities, uh, where we are in the process, both in person and virtually. And so uh, if you go to our website and eventually a specific website on the budget, uh, you'll see all of the meetings that uh, community members, staff, uh, board members may have access to. So uh, the next one will be January 25th in person at Crockett Early, High, uh, Early College High School. And so those will go on through the month of March, uh, even further if, if needed so as well. So this is just a, a, a graphic of the budgeting process. Uh, we, uh, of course, are in the month of January. Uh, the stars that you see there are basically our community engagement uh, that will be go going on over the next several months. Uh, the ultimate goal is to uh, be as transparent with information, uh, looking at budget priorities, having strong conversations uh, and guiding conversations on where we want to prioritize our limited dollars as a district. And so uh, the, the goal is by the time we get to June, uh, we as a school district, as a community, as a board know where our priorities lie. The budget that we will propose in the month of June uh, we want to make sure that uh, all of our uh, district staff, all of our board uh, are uh, well, uh, understand uh, the process, the budget, uh, and when you vote, uh, it's a comfortable vote that you know what you're voting on as far as the ultimate budget. Some of the revenue uh, budget assumptions. So early on uh, in the process, we, we do make some assumptions as a district. Uh, we are planning uh, on and our budget is going to be based on a flat enrollment. So we are basing our budget on 73,608 students for next year. Uh, that was our October snapshot this year. So uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, as realistic as we can be with enrollment. It has been declining over the past several years. So we feel that uh, budgeting on a flat enrollment will uh, really position the budget uh, where it needs to be. Uh, average daily attendance, 68,455 students. Uh, depending on the legislative conversations that happen, that may change if the legislature uh, decides to fund uh, school districts based on enrollment. So that's very preliminary in the legislative process. Uh, property value growth, we're looking at 15%. Uh, this past year we grew 19%, uh, so we are looking at a 15% growth next year. Uh, maximum compressed uh, tax rate of 0 0.7902, we add our eight golden pennies, and then our uh, debt service tax rate. There are uh, uh, discussions at the legislative level to continue to increase property tax compression. Uh, that is one of the priorities uh, of the legislative session this go-round, 
And so we know those are conversations that will be occurring over the next several months. And then appraisal collection fees, 2% uh, growth. As far as the overall expenditures, uh, again, our enrollment, 73,608. Staff compensation is going to make up, uh, with this budget year, 87% of our budget. And so it's gonna be important for us to really look uh, at staff compensation, our estimates uh, with uh, what we are looking at as a school district, and, and make sure that we uh, present uh, those numbers to the board so you all can make informed decisions. Uh, we're also looking at increased utility costs uh, and insurance costs in the district, and of course, recapture. So recapture is uh, a, a challenge, continues to be a challenge. Uh, there will be discussions during this legislative level, uh, legislative session regarding recapture. This year, we are expected to send $846 million back to the state. That's enough funding to fund another Austin ISD of 74,000 students. And so uh, that is 55% of our local tax collection. So it is a problem, especially when we are a district with 51% economically disadvantaged students. So uh, we will be uh, advocating uh, to change the system. I know uh, Trustee Boswell was at the Capitol today. And so we will do what we can and work with groups, uh, education groups, uh, to really take a look at, at recapture. I turn it over to Brandy. Good evening. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President Singh, Interim Superintendent Segura. Thank you for having me. Um, we wanted to run through a few of the human capital staffing considerations um, that would be a part of budget priority decisions. I want the board to be aware that every single uh, one of these actually came straight out of our long range planning committee. The, the, that committee did such tremendous work and put in hours and hours and hours and such thoughtfulness. And so um, what we're gonna talk about truly is um, the fruit of that, of that labor. So we're gonna start with, um, first of all, specialized staffing for small campuses. It was a rich discussion around this um, in LRP. As you know, our staffing guidelines, we have staffing formulas. Um, there are certain weights to those formulas, et cetera, et cetera. However, Small campuses do not benefit from a weight into a staffing formula in the same way that a large campus does. It, do, it does not matriculate into teacher FTEs and whatnot in the same fashion. So for that reason, we need to make sure that we are protecting and staffing our smallest campuses, uh, our most marginalized campuses as best we can and providing the staff that they need. Um, we are committed to that. It is approximately about a million dollars well spent, but it is certainly one of our, our budget uh, considerations. Um, going back into the weighting, uh, we are currently at a 1.1, at a 10% uh, weight. So a 1.1%, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a 1.1 um, uh, multiplier for weighting for, for, our, for economically disadvantaged percentage. Um, the, the intent would be to increase back to a 1.2 as it used to be, which would come at a $4.6 million uh, cost. Um, moving on into LMHPs or licensed mental health um, providers for campuses, we know, especially post-pandemic, I say post-pandemic um, with a caveat, uh, but we're still reeling. We will continue to, and mental health is incredibly important, taking care of the mental health of our students, our staff. Um, the ratio that we ran just as a mock-up was, uh, would be a one-to-one -one for secondary campuses and a one for every three elementary campuses at a $4.7 million price tag. Um, our facilitation, that is um, certainly uh, something of importance. It is a tremendous um, uh, amount of work at, at the campus level. Again, at a one-to-one -one for a secondary campus and one for every two elementary campuses would cost approximately $5.1 million. 504 coordination, um, same ratio, one-to-one -one for secondary and one for every two elementary campuses. Again, about a $5.1 million price tag on that. Uh, an increase to special education and bilingual stipends. Uh, we are actually weaving this into to a compensation package. We're, we're pulling it out because it, was, it did come out of LRP to make sure that we are um, doing everything we can to not only attract but retain um, our special education and bilingual educators. Um, and we want to go, um, we, we want to put all of our efforts as much as we can into making sure that, that we compensate um, not only fairly but, but certainly competitively 
um, with those from surrounding districts. And so increasing those uh, associated stipends uh, at a rate of about $6.8 million. Um, and again, that would actually be part of the compensation package that, that we're gonna talk about. Um, additional athletic trainers for 5A campuses, I'm not sure if it's widely known or not, but our 6A campuses have two uh, athletic trainers uh, to cover um, all of our athletic events. Our 5A campuses actually only have one, same number of sports, and so uh, $680,000 price tag to, to bring those up to, to be equal. Uh, there was uh, a recommendation out of LRP to have bus monitors for all routes, not just special education routes, and that would come at a price tag of $5.2 million. And then bringing back lunchroom monitors, that is, that is a conversation that we have often um, for $1.6 million. Um, I do want to, to, to make sure that everyone knows that, that when we talk about, I think we've said compensation at least 14 times tonight, and I want to say at 14 more how important it is. And so we want to make sure that we protect and build the, the, the absolute best compensation package we possibly can for our, for our staff. And so every single thing on, on this budget and these priorities is, is just that. It is a priority. It is important. We have to have some, some hard conversations about how we can, it's not, it's not really even this or that, it's how do you do both and to the best degree? And so, but there is a finite number of dollars and uh, infinite amount of need, and I, it, but this is the reality of, of what those dollars are. Now, speaking of compensation, um, we kind of stepped out of a comfort zone a little bit because as we know, we want to, um, budget discussions last all spring. We adopt the budget in, in, in June. Uh, we are no longer swimming in the same waters as we used to be in terms of staffing. Everybody's competing with everyone else and, and people want to know, what are you looking at? What is that, what is that gonna look like? How, the smaller districts around us, they, they adopt budgets on, on, on a different uh, timeline. And so you'll start to see very quickly three, four, five, what, what have you with percentages. So we wanted to make sure that we put out to our staff as fast as we could, what's even our starting point here for, for, for talks? And so we did send out um, a, a flyer to our staff to just let them know, hey, this is a top priority for us. We, we do not want you to, to, to sit and wait and wonder and get antsy. This is a retention strategy, strategy for our district to make sure that, that, our, that our staff knows that their compensation is top of mind. And so um, we just wanted to send out to our staff to make sure that they knew that, that that's what we were working on. Um, and we did run this through, through Education Austin. They are in full support that we let our staff know that, that, that uh, we want to take care of them and the, and the compensation package. So just very broadly, starting at a minimum 5% of midpoint uh, classroom rate, or raise for classroom teachers. So at minimum, and Mr. Ramos and I are very competitive, like that is, that is, that is where we want to start that conversation. We also want to, of course, make sure that we uh, uh, build into that compensation package, making sure we're taking care of our classified staff and the raise to, that, to the minimum uh, to the minimum pay, plus our admin and professional staff on the AP scale. So um, again, it, it is simply to let our staff know that, that they are top of mind in this budget season. One of the things I want to point out with staff compensation is, again, we are uh, in a legislative session. And so when we're having these conversations over the next several months in what uh, we can do with compensation, what our priorities are, what our plans are, that is based on current law. And so what we propose to the board uh, will be based on current law. So if during the legislative process uh, the result is uh, an additional allocation to the basic student allotment, if there's an increase, then we will come back and look at that additional funding and add to that compensation as well. By law, we have to uh, increase compensation uh, if the state increases the basic allotment, so that will be built in. Uh, but the conversations that we are gonna have over the next several months are based on current law and our current budget. Uh, one of the uh, uh, benefits that we have as a school district is we balanced last year's budget. We proposed a balanced budget this year, which we are on track to deliver. And so that really positions us as a district uh, to be very aggressive with a staff compensation package for our employees in the 23-24 school year. And so that is what uh, we will be continuing to look at. 
Also, as part of the uh, uh, budgeting process, we do look at equity uh, in budgeting. It's very important to us. It, we just had a presentation on equity uh, as far as uh, as part of the district. And so we did uh, work with the uh, equity uh, office uh, and came up with six indicators uh, that all departments and campuses will look at uh, when they create their budget. So we are looking at uh, leadership development for equity, uh, professional learning for equity, uh, cultural profic proficiency, and inclusiveness, uh, development of inclusive practices, transparent communication and community staff engagement, uh, the use of data that is broken out by race, socioeconomic status, zip code, uh, to make informed decisions uh, and programs, and then operational and supply costs. How are we uh, looking at our expenditures and, and really uh, looking at uh, equity in those conversations? So this would be uh, the first year that we really look at that holistically as a district. Uh, we will be able to present data to the board uh, as part of our process where we know exactly how much uh, we are spending within our budget that directly ties to equity. So uh, we are excited about the process uh, and, and we are building that into this budgeting uh, uh, development. And then of course, recapture. And so as our uh, enrollment uh, continues to decline or remain flat uh, and our property values continue to increase uh, at a rapid pace, uh, our recapture payment continues to increase. So last year, uh, we sent $761 million to the state. Uh, this year, we're planning, uh, we're projecting $846 million. And so that uh, basically translates to half of our $1 bill. When you look at our total budget as a dollar bill, 55% uh, of that goes back to the state. So that is uh, a continual uh, conversation that we will be having uh, with our community, uh, with uh, our legislators, uh, to see if we can gain some relief uh, during this legislative process. Then, of course, uh, legislative session, the 88th legislative session is uh, going on. It started January 10th. It will uh, go through May 29th. Uh, there are potential legislative uh, changes that we're already hearing about. This is just a small list. Uh, that list will continue to grow as conversations happen among our legislators. Uh, basic allotment uh, is uh, being looked at with a required salary compensation increase. Uh, the special ed funding uh, with uh, recommended changes, uh, they are looking at funding special ed uh, a little bit differently based on services uh, versus how they have funded it historically. So that came out of the uh, TEA special ed, uh, special uh, ed commission on uh, special ed funding. Uh, school safety, the school safety allotment is being looked at as well. Uh, if that is increased, that will give us opportunities in this distri district uh, to really look at school safety, social emotional learning, and so we are watching that uh, very uh, closely. Uh, currently, the school safety allotment is funded at $9 per student. Uh, there have been conversations of increasing that to $50 per student, all the way up to $250 per student, so if that occurs, uh, we will have some opportunities to uh, improve uh, how we fund school safety in the district. Uh, direct teacher salary increases. Uh, the uh, Lieutenant Governor just came out with his priorities recently. Uh, that is one of the priorities that he did include, which is teacher uh, compensation. Uh, counselor mental health supports uh, are being discussed. Uh, the formula transition grant assistance and then continued focus on property tax reduction. That is one of the uh, governor's priorities and so he will be looking at uh, continuing property tax reductions throughout uh, the district, uh, uh, the state. Uh, we do know that the state is coming into this legislative session with a $33 billion surplus. And so there are opportunities uh, for education funding and so we are, again, uh, going to be very active in advocating uh, for some of those dollars to be used uh, to increase uh, education funding. And with that, we open it up to questions from our board. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> So trustees, in addition to the questions on the budget, tonight is an opportunity for each of us to share budget priorities that we have for the upcoming year to allow the administration to review such proposals and report back. And um, we're doing this a little bit earlier in the cycle this year, which I really appreciate. Um, makes it a lot easier to put those changes in the budget. But I can already tell that you have taken a lot of our words to heart, so thank you. Feedback on the budget considerations, compensation plans, and community outreach shared during the presentation is also welcomed. So trustees, would you like to share your comments and priorities? Oh, yes, Trustee Foster. So thank you, as, as always, for, for the hard work and 
and also for the the, the, the jump we're getting on, on this. I really appreciate that. So just three quick areas, um, not in a particular order. One is that I appreciate um, the small supports, we'll call them, and, and maybe I shouldn't call them the small supports, but specifically investing in lunchroom monitors or specifically investing and in targeting in it at, by dollar amount, relatively small amount that can really make life easier for folks on campus. I really appreciate that type of thinking. And you know we have these experiences on campus where we talk to folk and they don't have the planning time. And we talk to folk and there's just different ways they're pressured where we can do something concrete for a relatively modest investment. And I am saying relatively. Um, same with, I, I don't know if I mentioned bus monitors, but I think bus monitors is a great idea. And these little things matter. So I appreciate those. And I think that's something where community feedback is really helpful. We listen and they tell us, you know, that there's teachers, families will tell us the things, you know. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, the second is that, um, when we look at school safety, um, so fundamentally important, and one of those areas where school safety can become this thing where, yeah, school safety, barbed wire for everyone, or school safety, we are targeting this much, the, by percentage, it's this much about mental health. It's this much about social emotional learning. If we are engaging officers um, in this, the new officers or the new money is about crisis intervention. It's not about you know something else. So I love the focus on school safety, and then more specifically when we dial in that it's targeted in ways that match our values and vision and what we know is best for our students. Uh, and then the final thing, really quickly. Absolutely no surprise, um, the compensation, teacher compensation, teacher staff compensation is everything. Um, at, uh, at the University of Texas, we're about to do our admission cycle and we're looking at, I, I don't like to say indentured servitude, but it's almost like indentured servitude to be a graduate student paid to be a teaching assistant and we pay like 21,000. Well, in order for us to keep attracting the best graduate students in the world, we have to recognize that the University of California system just decided that they're paying all their TAs 34,000. So how do we get from 21,000 to 34,000, right? So this is just by analogy. And then in other places, it's 40,000. I say that to say this. I'm not interested in a 5% raise for teachers. I'm interested in a thorough reimagining that matches what some places around the country have done. And yes, they're outliers, but they show that it's possible for our first starting teachers to make 70K. They've, they've shown it's possible. And some of the districts that do that look like ours. So I would love to see, and in, if actually, if, if in my little world, insistent upon seeing dramatic raises to compensation that reflect not just like the, the capitalist ethos of, you know, we want to buy, but it's also a measure, one of the many measures of respect for our teachers, and that the other, you know, drum I'll keep beating on this is both floor and ceiling. So that we say, well, if this is the new floor, it's got to be a graduated income increase as well. So that as you noted, our veteran teachers aren't suddenly compressed to what is the new starting wage. So I realize it's a lot of work because it's like, okay, you just described $2 worth of stuff and here's the dollar. So I get it. <laughs> But I, I, I know and I've seen your work and that you know how to, 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 to make, make the magic happen, I guess. Um, so I'll be looking for the compensation myself. I'll be looking for enhancements to school safety that lean towards mental health. Uh, and I'll be looking for all of those small supports that reflect what people on the ground tell us will make a difference 
in their professional experience and in our families and students' experiences. So thank you really for the, for the, for the work, and I guess we're just beginning. Thank you. Anyone else? Trustee Kaufman. Uh, thank you for the presentation and for the recognition of the various priorities that have been identified so far. Um, I wanted to go back to the bilingual education funding, and I had a question just around, I know it's complicated with the way that the funds are identified for the reporting purposes, but I'm, I'm surprised to see that we fell below the minimum required spend for the bilingual ESL allotments from the state. And I, I'm a little, uh, I don't quite understand the factors that were identified as possible reasons for that. Um, two were identified, staff vacancies and student ADA reporting. Um, I'm just wondering, um, staff vacancy seems like an unlikely cause since, um, since the classroom bilingual and ESL teachers are not eligible to be coded as PIC 25 or as bilingual ESL spend. And so those aren't even included in the equation. So I don't understand how vacancies would result in that big of a drop in spending. Um, I'm also not, I also would like to ask what, it, what is the role of the student ADA reporting in, in, in that? So last year we identified an issue in how we were uh, reporting or coding uh, bilingual students within our PIM software. And so that uh, error was caught, uh, the students were coded correctly. But that did not occur until late in the school year, uh, around the May, uh, June timeframe. And so by the time we reported the correction uh, to TEA and PEMS, uh, where we thought we were within the expenditure thresholds, uh, all, after the corrections, we fell actually below. And so one of the, uh, op well, one of the uh, ways to correct that is when you fall below the, the spending thresholds, you have a three-year average where you can correct that. And so that's one of the reasons that we're really looking at uh, bilingual stipends uh, and, and becoming aggressive with those stipends, increasing those stipends to make sure that we are uh, meeting not only our expenditure thresholds, but, but we are able to retain our bilingual teachers. Uh, as far as vacancies, uh, you are correct, uh, uh, Trustee Kaufman, that the actual salary, uh, we, we, we cannot code to bilingual, but uh, if there was a vacancy, then that's uh, one less bilingual stipend that we could pay, and that is what we do code uh, to the bilingual expenditures. And so as our student enrollment uh, has decreased over the past several years, uh, that's also translated to less bilingual teachers, which is less bilingual stipends. And so we are continuing to look at that uh, and making sure that uh, as a district, we, we try to maintain uh, full uh, employment uh, in those areas. So the corrections to the identification of students uh, resulted in additional students being identified as emergent bilingual or fewer students? So it, it resulted in uh, an ad additional <coughs> number of students uh, being uh, identified. And so based on what we budgeted, uh, that was not enough to meet uh, our spending requirement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, has there been a full commitment this school year to avoiding what has been termed mixed language classrooms, which refers to classrooms in which students in a bilingual program are in the same classroom with the same teacher as students who receive English only instruction? I'll have to let someone in. That'll be me. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Trustee Coffin. Yes, sir, the, the, there is still a full commitment that we, uh, at, we pure language the classroom and we staff that way. And so every effort to, to make sure that we maintain a pure language classroom is, is, is made. And does that extend to pre-K as well? It does, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and that means a classroom teacher for the bilingual program and a separate classroom teacher for the English, not using the TAs to? It, it means a separate uh, teacher for each program. There are certainly, there are certainly opportunities, you know, when, when we're in a vacancy situation that, that if we're in a staffing situation, we can't fill it, then we're gonna do the best we can with, um, if we've got you know, a Spanish speaking teacher, you know, we're right. gonna make that work, but it's only gonna be in a temporary fashion. Right. We the still- The allocation is there. I, the, allocation the allocation is still allocation there, is sir. There. Yes, sir. Okay, um, thank you. And so I, I do suggest that that remain a high priority budget issue this year to ensure that the, the full staffing of the dual language programs at both the elementary and the secondary level to ensure that the secondary schools have the positions to enable them to offer the, the content courses and language courses that are necessary for the dual language? Yes, sir. 
Um, dual language is only one of our multilingual education programs. English as a second language is an equally important program, um, but not discussed or often talked about as much. Um, and that's particularly important for emergent bilingual students who speak languages other than Spanish. Um, adequately staffing for dedicated ESL teachers where needed is something that has been cut in recent years, and I would like to offer that as a priority moving forward is to really identify where do we, you know, you don't always need a dedicated separate pull-out ESL teacher, but sometimes you do. And so just want to ensure that, that there is adequate staffing as a priority for ESL teachers. Um, and then also for effective professional development and coaching for all students, or for all teachers who are serving students in the ESL programs. Again, the priority is often focused on the dual language programs, but we need professional development and coaching at the campus and district level to ensure that the teachers who are ESL certified serving you know, one or more students in an ESL program are getting the support as well. Um, that's, that takes time and money. Um, I'll just make a statement here that, that investing in bilingual education is first and foremost an investment in serving students identified as emergent bilingual, most of whom are students born in the United States, but many of whom are also recent immigrants entitled to this support. Um, these students are legally entitled to effective bilingual and ESL services. Um, in addition, Austin ISD has a unique and long-standing commitment to providing multilingual opportunities to all students through two-way dual language programs. And we have a lot of work to do to ensure equitable access to two-way dual language for currently underrepresented student groups, including African-American students, students identified as living in low social economic conditions, secondary students, heritage speaking, Spanish speakers, and students participating in special education services. I just want to identify as a priority that in our allocation of scarce funds that we continue that commitment towards providing equitable access and opportunity for our dual language programs to all students um, and that it doesn't result in cutting the access while we're trying to expand access. Um, and then that kind of leads to a final question. Will the multilingual education team you know, be asked to and allowed to submit a budget request that they feel would truly enable schools to serve all multilingual learners through effective implementation of their dual language and ESL programs. I don't necessarily think that given the budget constraints that perhaps that goal may not be met with funding, but I would really like to see us budgeting in terms of what is it that we need to achieve the results for students rather than here's how much money you have, do the best you can. And so if, we, if they identify that they need X million dollars to meet those goals and they're only able to be funded at X minus you know, Y percent of the, those, that funding, at least we know kind of where we're standing and can, can make those adjustments. So, I would recommend that for all of our programs, but in particular for multilingual education because the numbers you presented show that it's really being in, I mean, underfunded at this time. So every, every department will have that opportunity. Uh, if uh, a, a department submits a budget above their current budget, uh, then uh, the overage will come uh, and be part of these discussions as far as budget priorities. And so us as a district and as a school board uh, will begin looking at those requests and prioritizing those requests. And I would just like to, again, push to ensure that those are genuinely open questions mm -hmm. and that there isn't pressure to say, you know, that. There's any pressure to under request for what the student needs are. Thank you, Trustee Kaufman. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ramos, could you um, address the question about uh, in ADA versus enrollment mm -hmm. and, and how that impacts the budgeting process? So uh, one of the uh, priorities that is being discussed is funding uh, education by enrollment versus average daily attendance. Uh, the thought behind that is that when uh, you walk into a teacher's classroom any given day, if that teacher has 15 students or 20 students, we still pay that teacher her salary. We don't reduce her salary because she has less students, he has less students. And so it makes it uh, uh, much more uh, manageable as far as the budgeting process when we are funded uh, based on enrollment. We know exactly uh, the amount of revenue that we will receive for the year. Uh, versus uh, based on the attendance, the average attendance over a school year. So uh, when you budget based on attendance, you kind of uh, do your best effort to estimate accurately 
uh, what that percentage is going to be. Historically, it's been between uh, 94 and 96 percent. Uh, with the pandemic, that's fallen uh, all the way down to 91, 90 percent. And so it, it becomes more challenging as a district. And so this does provide an opportunity for us to really uh, streamline our budgeting process. Uh, as a state, uh, Texas is probably one of only four states uh, that does fund based on attendance versus enrollment. And so that's another reason why we really want our legislators to look at that type of funding. Yes, Trustee Whitley Chu. Um, yeah, um, thank you so much for your, um, for your focus on, I would say, on teacher compensation. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, that first. Um, so when we're looking at teacher compensation, we're looking this, um, I'm pulling up the graph um, of teacher salary comparisons of Central Texas. When I'm looking at the Stetson report, um, they used uh, comparisons of other urban districts. So if we are looking at Central Texas, we're, we're underpaying um, everywhere, um, but we're essentially training teachers to leave our district. Um, and go somewhere else and be compensated more. Um, but I think we need to look at an actual market study. It's not just Central Texas, like um, Trustee Foster said. This is where, what are teachers making in urban districts in our state and throughout the country. Um, so I have some um, other priorities for, uh, you know, we started the school year um, with teacher vacancies and that, that can't happen again. Um, so some options of um, making sure we're open to paying um, TRS surcharges for retired teachers, getting these amazing veteran teachers to come and um, continue serving in our district, and having more part-time benefits eligible positions. I think we've been reluctant to do that in the past. I'll see 19 hour a week jobs posting, and um, people in this labor market aren't willing to do a 19 hour no benefits position anymore. Um, we have a lot of trouble um, with substitutes. Um, so teachers can't even be sick. They can't do the professional development opportunities we want to. So considering having permanent subs um, who are benefits eligible, making doing 20 plus hours a week um, and having those people maybe at, um, campus based. Um, so I wanna move on to um, priorities in special education. So, um, so also looking at the, the Stetson report, um, so making sure um, our LSSPs are, are paid competitively and um, fully staffing um, LSSPs, so that's licensed specialists in schools. So I know y'all know, but people watching licensed um, specialists in school psychologists who are doing evaluation, so having um, a fully staffed um, people who are our staff of our district. We have a lot of contractors, so um, not, not getting rid of contractors while we need them, but also building that capacity as our staff. Um, we have um, LSSPs who are working at six campuses. Um, we have people who live in my district. They live in District 4. They want to work in Austin ISD, um, but they don't want to work at, school, at six schools, and they can um, drive out of town and work at one school um, at an appropriate ratio and in more manageable working conditions. So we have to make sure um, we have those working conditions. Um, so yeah, having um, making sure our pay is very, very competitive for those LSSPs, educational diagnosticians, speech language pathologists, um, who are also um, doing a lot of evaluations if someone has um, a speech component in their special education evaluations so those um, speech language um, pathologists are, are really um, doing a lot of work helping us out so making sure we're fully staffed there and that we are um, at we are the highest um, compensation of, of course in central texas but also comparable to other urban areas um, i want to talk about stipends with special education um, so our stipend policy um, is um, if you have to have a, um, so say if you're a special education department chair, if there are fewer than five people in your department, um, you don't get that stipend as department chair. But even if you are at a small campus, those um, department chairs are doing a lot of work and they're helping us a lot. And sometimes it's because of vacancies. So if they're a vac doing a vacancy, they might be doing several people's jobs. So making sure 
this is not just for next year's budget, but for this year's budget um, that people are getting, are gonna get their stipends this year. Um, let's see. And moving on to the essential areas redesign that happened last year. Um, I've had a lot of families, even like students approach me who are unhappy with their art and music being, being lowered at their campus. Um, so making sure that students are getting uh, more art and music next year. I know at a few campuses they are getting just as much or maybe more, uh, but making sure that's happening for all of our students. And um, for our classified staff, um, yeah, making sure that their compensation is high. I'm really excited about the lunchroom monitors, bus monitors. Uh, we won't fill those positions if they're um, not uh, compensated appropriately. And compen um, so also our custodial staff, um, that's been a huge um, issue that those positions have been cut or unfilled. So making sure they're compensated well. Um, also, those have historically been campus-based positions, and that is um, wonderful for campuses and um, needs, to, needs to happen. And um, I just, this is kind of for everyone. Um, we're doing our, our reading academies, so making sure we have appropriate curriculum um, that aligns with the, the reading academies, um, because if students can read, they, they can learn anything. So. Uh, making sure reading is prioritized in the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Whitley Chu. Anyone else? Trustee Lugo. Um, thank you for the presentation and for the great questions from my colleagues. Um, so I have some softball questions for y'all. <laughs> I'm feeling generous. Um, so where can the public see how the long range planning committee's work has contributed to some of the budget conversations? Like I know y'all are telling us that there's that, you know, connection, um, but is there anything that's publicly available that would be like super simple, like at a glance or something that could help folks see like the fruits of the labor of the LRP have influenced these conversations? So, um, Trustee Lugo, uh, currently right now, I don't think it's as visible as we'd like it to be. One of the things that we're doing is working with, uh, with Ed Ramos, DCCE, to actually build a web page um, that's specifically around the budgeting process. And our hope is that that becomes the kind of nucleus for the connection between the LRP. My goal is that every time we present anything, it actually identifies the strategy that's back in the report. And, and we're gonna be doing that moving forward. Uh, but that is where it's going to be outward facing and then you'll see it threaded through all of our documents uh, And we're also open to any ideas that you may have That's great. No, that's ex and uh, anytime I hear strategic I get excited um, Just have to say um, The other thing uh, picking up on something that um, Trustee Whitley Chu mentioned so my understanding is that custodial staff are no longer campus-based they're um, I guess like centralized and so if someone can confirm whether that's true and then the second question would be um, you know as as um, you know whether they're classified as requests or just hopes um, as these as these uh, requests are made um, for example you know reverting back to having campus-based custodial staff like what would it take Right, um, because to y'all's point, there's a finite amount of money. There are endless priorities, and like which lever? I, I hate making this analogy, but like which lever do you, you know, um, push or pull? Um, and and how do you how do you select the the lever that will have the greatest impact? Knowing that those levers are actually impacting people, right? Um, so, so that's my two-part question. I will confirm that, that custodial staff was centralized uh, under operations. Um, <coughs> Superintendent Segura, would you like to yeah. talk about that transition? Yeah, absolutely, uh, I certainly can. So, um, Tristy Lugo, about a year and a half ago, um, actually prior to the pandemic, one of the things that we ran into was a challenge in how we support all of our campuses. And that really started on that Thursday when all the campuses closed. 
Uh, what we ran into was a challenge in actually turning all the campuses over before the summertime shut down. And what we ran into was that we weren't able to actually move custodial staff to other campuses. For instance, a high school may have 12 or 14 um, custodial staff, while an elementary school may have only three. And so if you have a, a, custodial, a custodian that's out um, over a period of time, it really impacts that campus. What we ran into was I wasn't able at that time to actually move staff within the organization to go help an elementary school, a middle school, and, and there was no flexibility. It was very, very rigid. Uh, that was exacerbated and, and reinforced when Winter Storm Uri actually occurred. When Winter Storm Uri uh, occurred, um, our system was impacted and we were unable to actually relocate or move custodial staff to support the system. So we began to work at that time um, with Ed uh, and Brandy uh, and myself as the COO to develop, develop a solution that was more consistent with what we see um, elsewhere uh, in the state. And for us, uh, the recommendation at the time was to, to centralize them. Uh, we did not move them. They're still at their home campus. And it's really a shared support system. Uh, the central, uh, the administration supports the, the training. We support um, the, the, the materials, all of the equipment. And so we were responsible for the quality, but couldn't ensure the actual responsibility of, of the work. And so that is the purpose for that um, centralization at that time. Um, and, and that's kind of how we got to this point. But it was those two things. All right, that's really helpful. And it's really, it, uh, at least for me, it's really helpful to understand, like, well, what was the problem? Like, and how did you arrive at the solution? And then also just that reassurance that um, at least what I'm hearing is that most or maybe all of the custodial staffs stayed at their, what would have been considered their home campus. C correct. So Trustee Lugo, I would say 94 or 5% of them stayed. Um, one of the things that we also looked at was just the, um, the ratios of square footages. We actually worked with um, at Austin and identified um, different strategies to improve our, our efficiencies. So we actually purchased um, auto scrubbers by way of Esther. We, at one point, we only had 20 auto scrubbers in the school district. Now every single campus has an auto scrubber. And so we. What's an auto scrubber? <laughs> an like auto scrubber zamboni. is a. It's like a. It's like a. Have you ever seen a zamboni? Oh my a, gosh! <laughs> so it's a zamboni for floors, essentially. Um, <laughs> and and so we looked at at a, at a solution that um, that provided a a a team for a campus, and then we actually organized them so that the elementary schools could work with the middle schools and the vertical as well as the high schools. Mm -hmm. And in that way, if they were going to have to move to support a, 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 catastrophic, a catastrophic event like Winter Storm Uri, they were actually only moving within the uh, vertical team. or within, and, and so that's the approach that we adopted. Um, and, and there was some movement, but I would tell you that it's probably, you know, again, it's, it's less than four or 5% in the last year and a half. They're, they're all mostly there. Great. That's so helpful, really. Like, and and being able to get that information in advance, because y'all know people are going to call us, right? They're going to be like, "We we miss our custodian," and it's like, "I don't know about that." Um, so, thank you for that information and for the explanation. That's tremendously helpful. Um, the other question is so. Um, maybe y'all already have this in place. Do y'all have like a three-year budget vision and like a specific like budget strategic plan? So I'm, I'm thinking really about along the lines of wouldn't it be great, right, if in three years we could, you know, X, Y, and Z, um, and even if we're, we're not um, – getting to those goals as quickly as we want. I think it's helpful to see like, hey, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Like we may not be able to do X and Y this year, but there are plans to attempt to get closer to that next year. So we do deliver uh, to the board a, a forecasted budget over the, the next several years, uh, but we have not uh, identified specific goals where we would like to get in two, three years. So that is something that we will definitely add uh, the, this go round. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Any other trustees? Um, <laughs> was it? Okay. Trustee Gonzalez, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, y'all were not joking. It is very cold over here. My, <laughs> my nose is cold. My fingertips are cold. Okay. Um, so, 
Uh, thank you for presenting this information. It's been very helpful. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll try to like divide them up into categories. Um, first, to uh, one of the points that uh, Vice President Foster raised, I would be interested in seeing, I don't even know if it's possible, if it's something that you could, but like the dollar amount to percent staff raise like trade-off. You know what I mean? Like if, if we were to do a 5% or a 6%, like what, what's the difference between each of those percentage amounts? You don't have to give it to me right now, but um, I, I'd just be curious to know that. We're already um, calculating we, those. Oh, okay, yeah, I figured. Uh, but I'd be curious, you know, to have it. Uh, second, um, that's like a big question. I also appreciated um, the issues that were raised related to special education by Trustee Whitley Chu, and then also um, how we conceptualize campus safety by Vice President Foster. Um, I saw in the slideshow that you presented uh, a ratio of LMHPs to secondary and then to elementary school campuses. I'd like to ask for some nuance in how that ratio is determined at the elementary school level. Three Managing three campuses in District 6 uh, might be very different than you know managing three campuses in District 7 or in District 1 or in District 4 or wherever we're talking about. Um, and I'd almost like, I don't know how everybody else feels about this, but I'd almost like to see the ratio uh, flipped, like have more support at the elementary level so that those interventions don't have to be made so severely in secondary when, it, when it's already so late in the game. Um, also related to that, um, our district does not have BCBAs, so I'd, I'd be curious to know what the cost would be to bring that position back also to help support students if we're seeing things like school avoidance that affect our ADA, you know, and, and thus how much money we're able to, to bring in. Um, I'd also be curious to know, uh, or to know how much money the district spends on mediations. Um, I also saw that um, there's a $6.8 million increase for um, stipends for special ed and bilingual teachers. I want to know how much that would that would be, you know, for a specific individual teacher. I think that'd be helpful for our teachers, bilingual and special education teachers to know. Um, I also appreciate Trustee Whitley Chu for bringing the point about uh, small campus stipends for department chairs. I was a department chair on a tiny campus and I had a va I can remember because it was very difficult. I had a vacancy, right? And so I had a, a, a kind of rotating cast of um, substitutes that were going through that classroom. And it was, it was a lot of work for me to have to run the department to help oversee the PLCs, to run my own classes, and then also ensure that this class at a permanent substitute was still functioning. Like, it, it's a lot of work. Um, and I, you know, wasn't eligible for the department chair stipend. Um, I'd also like to see what it would cost to provide those department chair stipends to LOAT and CTE department chairs, because my understanding is that they don't receive those right now. Is that correct? Mr. Ramos, I'm, he just he continues to look at you, and I know that these questions are mine. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just letting him look at you. <laughs> I'm now, not doing but, that um, It's okay. Y'all can keep looking at, at Ed. Um, I actually have the answer to, to quite a few of these. Just... It, and I don't know that that you want them right now, but, no, you don't, but, yeah. in, but really, to be very honest, and it goes back to, to, to questions that you had, Trustee Whitley Chu, first of all, we absolutely are looking at, at stipends for department chairs. Um, regardless of school size, the work is the work is the work. So that's an easy, that's an easy one, that, and that's something that we can control quite quickly. Um, we actually already do pay TRS charges. Please, please come back and teach here, uh, please. Um, that's already something that we have have done. When we talk about what are the ratios for, it's a mock-up. It is a cost-out model, so it's not it's not a formula. It's just what would it look like at that. So we can cost out, and and make those priorities look different, whatever numbers we want to look at, and in whatever model we want to look at. Um, I feel like I've forgotten some of the questions okay. that you might have. I said a lot of things, but. When we're talking about can we do these things, uh, absolutely, that, that's actually an equity issue. How, why are we not paying our department chairs the same across the board, regardless of school size, because it's, it's about the work. Um, we have come back in and said, are we counting substitutes as, as part of that teaching staff this year? We've actually gone back and fixed some of our errors because, frankly, if, you're the, if you are a department chair that has a substitute rather than a teacher, it's actually more work because you're having to manage 
keeping that sub afloat as well. So fully mm -hmm. heard, and we are already working on that, regardless of ne next budget cycle that's happening now. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a few more, sorry. Uh, the um, What Vice President Foster said about raising compensation, yes, and I don't want people to get this twisted to say that I'm not in favor of that, but it it's just not the end all be all. You know what I mean? Like there's all these other systems of support that even if I'm being paid $75,000 a year, if they're not there, it's just not a functioning ecosystem that I'm in, you know what I mean? Um, so I just would not like us to get like myopic yeah. on increasing compensation as the answer to everything. Um, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Who's next? Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you all for this, and thank you, everyone, for the fantastic conversation and questions. It's, I'm very glad to be talking about it, talking about it now and talking about this in such a, a deep, specific, um, optimistic, robust way. So thank you. Um, before I get to the fun, happy questions, I'm going to start with some other questions, which is if we're talking about new spending, we're talking about significant increases in wages, we're talking about what I agree are really beautiful things like the campus supports, the 501 coordinate, uh, the 504 coordinators, the lunchroom monitors, things that we know, um, I think as Trustee Gonzalez said, are some of those things that make our educators' lives and jobs easier in ways that aren't tied to raises but are tied to better supports. Um, are we looking at significant savings somewhere? Are we looking at significant cuts somewhere? Um, I know we are hoping for more funding, um, but, but what is the, the rest of the picture here? I, I'd love a stronger understanding of kind of what you're envisioning and what we need to be talking about with our community and what the trade-offs are. So ultimately, as, as part of this process, once we receive uh, final numbers uh, from our estimated property value growth, uh, from what we are projecting as far as our overall students uh, that we're expecting next year, we're going to be able to uh, give the board the amount of funds that we have to work with. And so those are, are going to be uh, conversations that, that are gonna be challenging. Uh, again, because we wanna make sure that we prioritize certain expenditures in the district. So what uh, we have to spend for next year, uh, there's gonna be requests above that, we know that. And so there are some tough conversations that are, that are gonna occur. Uh, we, we're not gonna be able to do everything that we want to, uh, but the board will have uh, an idea of what we have to work with. Uh, as far as uh, efficiencies or reductions, uh, one of the opportunities that we have, because we did balance the budget over the past two years, is looking at uh, continuing to uh, reduce staffing. If that occurs, it's through attrition. Uh, as employees leave, uh, we look at vacancies and determine if that is a position that we need to rehire or we need to dissolve from our budget. So that's one of the areas we're gonna look at. We also have the opportunity over the next several years uh, because uh, we did pass the 2022 bond. Uh, we do know that that is going to provide some efficiencies in the district. Uh, those are going to take a few years to occur, uh, but we know that they will happen. Uh, energy efficiency, uh, looking at uh, less uh, uh, funds that we spend on repairs. Uh, so those are some of the areas that we will gain as a district. And so those would also provide opportunities uh, for us. Uh, we also like to compare ourselves to other districts throughout the state. Uh, uh, Trustee Chu talked about looking at uh, comparing ourselves to other urban districts. So we are going to look at, uh, as a district, this is what we spend in different functional areas. Is that comparable to some of the other large urban districts? And if it's not, let's take a look at that. And, and is it a district priority uh, that's causing that? Or is it an inefficiency that we need to dive deeper into? So those uh, calculations, uh, that those um, um, uh, evaluations are, are coming as part of this process. Okay, thank you for all of that. Um, I know our community showed up for our district in a huge way with the bond, and I think it would be very helpful. One of the promises made was that it would free money to pay our teachers and other staff um, more. Right. And so I would love to see a projection of what we expect to save each year. I know that was part of the work that was done. And that should be part of our budgeting process, not only as we're looking at this year, but as we're looking ahead to 
future budgets, just so we can really be very clear with our community when and what we expect to have available as a result of that work. And I think that should continue to be part of these conversations each and every time. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and the administrative cost ratio is looking at that part of, of the cuts. I know that's not going to get us everywhere we need to be. Um, but do we believe that the standard for districts our size that TEA recommends is where we should be, that being smaller was the right place, is looking at that part of what's going on? And do we have data that show um, those additional costs got better student outcomes and, and made things better? Do we feel like that was not the right investment? Um, and that our money is better deployed in the classroom, kind of what's our thinking behind that and what's the planning for that? So we are going to have to continue to look at uh, function 41 and 21 expenditures, administrative cost expenditures. Uh, we also haven't done the, the analysis as far as are we uh, really, uh, for what we spend, are, are we achieving the student outcomes? And so that's another analysis that we need to do as a district. Uh, but one of the things that we do know is that when we compare ourselves to some of the larger uh, urban districts, uh, uh, Fort Worth, uh, Fort Bend uh, ISD, uh, for example, uh, Cy Fair ISD, our administrative cost ratio is above theirs. So we do know that uh, large urban districts uh, do function uh, with a lower administrative cost ratio, so uh, that really uh, begs us to look at our data and, and see where uh, we can achieve efficiencies. Thank you for that. Yeah, as preparation for this meeting, I took a tour of some of those um, reports at TEA and saw the same thing. And I know it's harming or frustrating as well, so I appreciate that work and that look and also those questions about really what that achieved for us or what it didn't. Right. Um, and whether that money is better spent elsewhere. So thank you for that. Um, I really want to second uh, the conversations that have come about support for campuses and classrooms, not talking about the fun parts. Um, and I do appreciate the options that were listed based on the long range planning. And I think we've also been hearing since the budget cuts last year um, of things that may be uh, penny wise and pound foolish, maybe that they, they the costs were larger than the savings in some ways that we maybe didn't anticipate. Things like losing instructional coaches, losing some of the behavioral supports from central office that were able to come to campus, so some of the mental health supports that came from central office. I know there have been big changes to the SEL, um, social emotional learning and CPNI, cultural proficiency and inclusion staffing. Um, and, and the answer when I asked was basically, well, campuses have been trained and now they're going to take care of that. That and and that may or may not be the way to really get where we where we need to be. And I think to Trustee Gonz Gonzalez's point, some of these supports actually lift the burden on teachers, better support teachers in ways that aren't directly tied to compensation for every um, educator, but that do offer other benefits in other ways. So um, that is one of my um, my priorities is really to look thoughtfully at each of those supports and how maybe a smaller number of positions can really have a very big impact um, on the, the way our teachers feel. And I think our educators and people who spend time on our campuses and with our students probably have a lot to share with us about that. And I think the answers aren't going to come from here. I think the answers are going to come um, from there. So I appreciate that as a priority. I'd also love to explore ideas um, that I think would have relatively small costs that might make a difference in um, the way our staff feels in, in their day-to-day -day kind of quality of life and employee retention and well-being. And again, I think the, the ideas will come from them more than they will come from us, but I'm imagining things like childcare on more campuses. I know the city's interested in partnering on childcare. There are a lot of organizations. We have space. Um, and I know where there are child care um, facilities on campus, both for children younger than pre-K, teachers stay or teachers come. And that's a very powerful benefit um, that, that is separate from compensation that really improves. And a lot of our educators are, you know, people who have children are, are, um, or grandchildren who would love to be there. Another, um, we have a lot of employees who come from outside Austin. It might be a benefit to have a transportation service, a hub, a park and ride where we can bring people in and they can use that time to get extra work done instead of sitting in the car in traffic. Maybe that's a benefit, you know, a bus with Wi-Fi so our educators can, can commute together and work. I don't know that people would want that, but I think if we go ask people 
if those are things, I mean, I lived in New York for nine years, I rode the subway, I got tons of things done during my commute because I wasn't driving. Um, so I think there are ideas probably out there for, for relatively small but creative expenditures that might get us to some good places. And again, I hope we can just ask and wait for ideas to come and, and see what people might have to share with us. And there might be other great examples from other districts as well. We're not the only people um, with these challenges. Uh, something I'm hearing very clearly from the campus level um, from educators is TA pay for um, TAs who work in special education, that the turnover is high, that the disruption is huge, that the job, especially if you're talking about a life skills classroom or something with really intense um, challenging work and, and people who show up with the heart for it, but we need to take care of them. We need to take care of our students and that that is a real need. Um, so just want to be sure we're talking about that. I think um, parent support specialists and family engagement support, again, I think that's a place where cuts do more harm than the savings we get. If we you know, pay for really strong parent engagement support, strong parent support specialists, where we need them, strong um, support for those parent support specialists to do great things on campuses. That's an enrollment boost that, you know, it doesn't take many students to pay for that position. If that's something that retains people, keeps people attending school, helps our students succeed. Um, so I want to be sure we're really looking thoughtfully at that. Um, I remain interested in an ombudsman. I uh, remain very interested in that, and I, I also know the cuts to college and career advisors um, were pretty disruptive at some campuses, and, and that that is a need. Um, not spread among other counselors necessarily, but a, a designated, deeply specialized college and career advisor can make a profound difference for students. Someone with relationships with admissions directors and other things, we had that. We lost that in some very important places. We got. Um, a, a really, really powerful letters about the college advisor at um, Garza, who's no longer, and, and the life-changing difference she had made for years and years of students. So I think that's, that was a couple of years ago. Um, but I think there, there are, it's a question worth asking of how well it's working now and whether we can do it better. Um, and then I appreciate the conversation about the custodial staff. Um, and you know, I remember um, after the changes were made, I was hearing something different from some of the custodians who felt like it wasn't working especially well. That their their schedules sometimes they were being expected to work late. I, you know, I hope that it's it's in a really good spot. Where that what you describe, I think, is is different from what I had heard, and I, I assume that it's just found its level. Um, by now, my information is old, but I want to be really sure that that we're in a good place with that. Please. So, uh, Trustee Boswell, you maybe think of something that had actually been occurring over the fall semester. Uh, you're exactly right. You know, one of the things that we wanted to do was to offer a schedule um, to our elementary school, middle school, and high school campuses. And then what we what we heard is that you know it's it's a starting place, but not the tailored solution. And so we actually had uh, Linda Coronado, who is our director of housekeeping, uh, meet with every single uh, principal over the course of the fall semester. Now. That got going a little bit later, probably around October, September, October timeframe. But we actually agreed in many cases to a modified schedule when it worked for the campus. We had the principal sign off as well as the housekeeping specialist. And then I actually reviewed them at that point. And so in that way, in that kind of tailored kind of solution for the campus, we made the adjustments were appropriate and, and, it, and it's worked. Um, so I feel good about where we are. Okay. But Yay and thank you. I appreciate that. That's fantastic. Um, and just a couple of other questions. Um, do we have a plan for HB 4545 and the tutoring supports that are required if that continues to be required but not funded? Um, and we've been using ESSER dollars um, for that. Do we have a plan for funding that? And what do we expect the impact to be on our budget? So we have, we have one final year uh, where we can use ESSER $3 for House Bill 4545. Uh, if the, uh, that requirement continues, then we will absorb that as a district. And so uh, I can't come back with a, what that would cost, uh, but we do have those numbers. I'd love to know looking out kind of what we expect that to be, and, and that can be a point of advocacy 
um, as well for the district, um, the impact and the, the cost impact and the benefit for students. So uh, thank you for that. And then the only other um, just comments, um, I'd like to really have a conversation as a board and a, an administration and a community about how we're measuring the outcomes of the impact of our budget. You know, how do we know that the decisions we're making are or are not getting the results we're looking for? And I think our monitoring reports are one place we can do that. Um, and I'd really like to be thoughtful together about how we might ask those questions early on so we can course correct during the year if there's reason for that and so we can use what we learn to budget for subsequent years to make sure that we're putting our money in places where it's really making a difference. Um, and, and using data, using evidence, um, not only for best practices from other places and what's proven to work, but what we see working um, on our campuses and on our really diverse mix of campuses. So I, I would appreciate just some thought together about that. Um, and I know that there are some districts that also have a budget committee that works all year and then asks those questions um, as part of, of the work of the administration and the, the board together um, can just meet regularly and this is kind of like our CBOC meets to talk about our bond spending and, and keep that on track, really just ask those questions um, and help share that work. So there are many ways to do it, but I think the important thing to me is that we do it. Um, and that we really use what we learn to inform what we're doing for our students and how we're using these dollars that are never going to be enough. So every single one of them really needs to count. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Boswell. Anyone else? Trustee Sabata. I First, uh, thank you for all your hard work. And I, I'm also on the same page with everyone about compensation. That's really the priority. And, um, but it's compensation across the board, because I remember when we took away the vacation days from the bus drivers, but we gave them a $21 increase. And so if we're going to raise and compensate everyone, we should be able to give them back their vacation days um, because, um, you know, those are the very, um, I mean, they're, they are also very, very committed to their work and we need them and we need to be able to keep them. And so um, as we look at uh, compensation, it's, you know, what uh, the cafeteria people, the custodians um, and bus drivers, uh, I'm hearing even parent supports don't get equal pay. So how are, is the equity department looking at, or can you look at how we can make that across the board um, increase that's gonna keep people uh, intact and, and not leave? Um, so that's, even though the city and the county did increase their wage to $20 an hour, if our bus driver's getting 21, that's great. Why don't we start at 21? Um, and so, um, so that's the, the money, piece, that one money piece. Um, also on the LSS piece, is that what they're called? The, the assessors. Um, I know they get assigned several campuses and I've heard from teachers um, and them themselves that it would, you know, it's so much paperwork um, that if they could just invest in that one campus, because they're huge campuses, um, we're gonna be getting more effective work and efficient work that will help us with all our, um, as, as, we, um, as we try to improve more efficiency and SPED, um, that these specialty positions, um, and I know we did used to do a lot of contracts, and we still are, but building, building our own, so that um, so that we're able to stay on top of uh, all the assessments that need to be happening in SPED, because they're they're so, you know, it's like you finish one group, then it's the new group is coming back in. The cycles just run. Sometimes feel like they run into each other. And so this would help us to stay on top of our, 
what our students' uh, needs are. Um, the Title I, <laughs> I remember that conversation. I, I didn't, I didn't ap appreciate that one when they moved the money, and I heard it from all my schools, moved the money to other campuses because the money followed the student. The campus did not qualify for that percentage to be a Title I, but the money was, the, the st strategy was just follow the student. And um, a lot of our campuses were affected and, and need those resources because they still have a higher number of uh, students that qualify and should be getting those extra resources. So I'm glad that we're having that conversation so we can um, relook re -look at that, that piece. Um, I try to write big enough, but it's... Oh, and the stipends. Um, for teachers, um, bilingual ed teachers get a stipend, but ESL teachers don't. And I know there's a certification paper that requires, that is required to get that stipend, but they're still being asked to do a lot of the translations because there isn't someone available. And so how do we make it, how do we address that as an equity issue? Because they're doing the work. They just don't qualify because of the documentation. So if we could look at that, because um, we don't want to lose them either. <laughs> and, and, and we need it, and all our campuses need uh, uh, translations. Every single campus always find, they even um, get a lot of parents to do it. So if, if people are not going to be compensated, um, it's going to hurt our, uh, it's going to hurt our, our campuses academically. Um, oh, on the programs um, that I know I was one that wanted to see if we could audit every program we invest and how long we've been investing because um, I wanted us to see if, I think, uh, possible you just mentioned it, um, about accountability. Um, how are those investments helping our student growth? Um, there are programs that we continue to fund, but doesn't really impact growth of that student. Um, and our investment from the city for parent support specialists, um, huge, it's, it's a huge need, but our parent support specialists, because of our staff shortage, are not really able to invest the time they need to with the parents, you know, and that's affecting student outcomes. When the parent is not able to be able to participate in events or trainings, that P I used to be a PSS and I used to do a lot of trainings, and the only reason I agreed to be a PSS is I will only work with parents, and my principal let me just do that. And it, it made a big difference. When we ran our primetime program, the parents organized it, the parents taught it, the parents organized a big pep rally. You know, parents can really bring a lot of, um, a, a lot of support, and, um, and also you're helping them to develop as leaders at their school community. So, um, so I'm, I'm still, if, if there's a way to, get a list of um, that audit of the programs to see, um, uh, you know, uh, which ones were continuing and, and how are they helping. For example, Primetime, I was a co-founder of Primetime and I wrote that application where parents could read it and understand it. If I could understand it, they could understand it. And, and, but they're not part of the process. And so um, that was an other program that was to help built community with the, even at Aikens, I had students teach a prime time program and uh, they were paid a stipend. It's a way to build that community of learners at the, at the pro, at those particular, any campus that wants to do prime time. So um, there are ways to, um, 
built that community of learners with a lot of things we're doing on school at school, but they're not currently as connected as it should be. For example, I, I, I focused on a lot of reading in my prime time program because we were low in reading scores. And so that goes back to the connection to student growth. So a lot of those um, programs that we have, um, I think we need to look at specifically how they tied in with the CIP because um, that's where we want to measure. That's the whole campus goals. And so how do we begin to really use that as a tool um, at every campus? Because a lot of parents, I ask them about, a C have they been to a CAC or a CIP? They, they don't know those, al those alphabet letters, CACs or CIPs. And, and they should because they're key stakeholders and they, that's untapped talent that um, we're missing out on. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I did that one. I'm sorry, I just. Um, yes, you also mentioned on the budget about how much we invested in music, art, and PE, and you referred to the caller that called in. Um, so yes, it's seven million. I believe you mentioned it was invested, but I think one of our, my, one of my colleagues asked, you know, if there's a way to, is there already a report to show that it's working or not working, or what do we need to do? Does is that sufficient dollars or not? Uh, so again, it's evaluating what's in the budget to make sure that it's, uh, it's gonna help build our student out outcomes and success for our campuses. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sabata. Anyone else? Yes, Trustee Hunter. Thank you. Um, what they said, because I'm not going to go over all of that. I'm just, there's some things I do want to highlight. But um, I sent you the really long list, just waiting for those answers back. And tonight I'll be sending you another really long list. And we can do that um, off the dais. But um, there's something I, I want us to begin with. And that uh, was with the special education report. When someone is wounded, you have to be oh so gentle. And look at me when I say, Every parent whose child receives special education who has remained in Austin ISD is wounded. And we have to be so careful with what we say. Nothing harmful, but just sometimes the way we say things, yes, we are doing above the requirement. It's still not enough, right? And so I think we always want to follow with that, that we are doing it. We, want, we need to do more. We want to do more. I think everybody has put that on their priorities. So when we are speaking about... Um, the budget and special education, and I have not heard that, but I have heard it before from Austin ISD, so I want to be real careful that we don't make it seem like children who receive special education services in their families are a burden because they need so much more. That's what equity is, right? We take care of those to get those people what they need to be successful. So I, I just want to start that at that piece. Um, when it comes to the um, budget priorities when we're speaking with the community, we need to be hearing from the community. So if we have an hour long meeting, then 10 minutes of that is Austin ISD explaining recapture, right? 10 minutes of that, like total, is everything they need to know. It's like, if you'd like to know more, here's where you can go. Because the people who really want to know more, they're going to go there anyway. The people who just want to tell you what's on their heart and mind, they could give a flying flip about recapture. Right? They understand. It's like my kids. They don't care where the money come from. But when they go to the Wi-Fi and they flip on the light, they want it to work. Right? I remember when I had that debit card and my daughter was like, just use your card. It's like, that's not how that works. There's something attached to that. And there are parents who want to know more about what's attached to that. But for the most part, they just want to say, listen to me. Hear what I say. Right? And if we do that in those meetings, I promise you, their, but their priorities will align with our priorities. I promise you. Um, uh, special education, I got that one. Staffing, everybody said that. But I'm going to take a point of privilege and pride to talk about small schools. Everybody was really excited to stand in front of the cameras and say, look at Prince, Principal Roby. She took our school from a C to an F. 
where's her staff? Because as soon as leveling happened, she was down to nothing. We cannot do that. What we say to those principals is, you've been trying to go. You'll figure it out. Yeah, they do. She and Mr. Mejia get together and say, you share a Spanish, have a Spanish teacher? Yeah, I'll take the other half. Right? We can't keep doing that. Because that, then we want to penalize a school. Well, you can't, because low enrollment. <laughs> How did that happen? I just had a parent, and I had to be really honest with that parent. She goes, oh, I'm so interested in Sandra Means. What do you think? And I was like, it's a work in progress. You're not going to have Spanish, too, for non-Spanish non speakers. You're not going to have this. You're not going to have that. But what we need are more parents with social capital so we can get that. Right? And so she still decided to send her kid there, and I'm glad because it's a great school. And my daughter has blossomed there. But what we have to do is if that's a special program, then what you said, that budget, then they need special circumstances, right? So yeah, they got 300 kids, but look at the need. You got half the sixth graders reading from first to fourth grade. They need more people, right? But because we say you have less numbers, right? Less numbers don't mean there's a less need. So I'm glad that you guys are taking care of that, and I appreciate that. Point of privilege while we're still at Sadler Means. Miss Alicia is the custodian at Sadler Means. She has been there since 2015. Her daughter Yvette is the secretary who has been there since the school opened. And I had the privilege of teaching her daughter April, who went on to Lhasa and then graduated. That's how important custodians are. I'm getting goosebumps. When she saw me bring my daughter in, both the custodians were like, me! I was like, me! And so it was exciting. So custodians are big, they're family members. They're, they're the same as any principal or teacher. So having them feel comfortable and happy in their spaces, yeah, I'm about that. Um, the compensation. When we show that chart, as my good friend pointed out last night, that red chart is if you own the money. That red line is if you own the money, you got all your plates spinning. If you're a new teacher and you're struggling, you're going to be on that blue line for quite a while. We want to talk about um, veterans. We're not going to get to the veteran compression. The people that are in the system, those might, those might stay, right? But we're not, for those teachers that have just come in this year, that big group y'all just brought in, they're not going to stay. Andrew has said it because he's a teacher. He just came out the trenches, right? So he knows. People will go to work for $60,000, $70,000 if they are happy, if it's an exciting place to go, if there's support. You can say, look, come to Austin ISD. You're only going to make $65,000, but you're going to have a dedicated coach, not another teacher, but someone that's dedicated to you. You're going to have planning time. You're going to be able to go to that. But if we can't offer that, right? So I think that, that that's important when it comes to that. Um, campuses knowing what their FTEs are early. I don't know how we fix that. I don't know, like, if, like, do we have to pass the budget, like, officially, officially, to tell them to hire for that? Because if we don't, then they need to know. That. Because that also would help those CTE numbers. If you know you're going to have, if, and the worst thing ever is for kids to sign up for whatever, and there's no teacher. That tells parents, we don't care. You like, nobody said that. Yeah, you did. We don't care enough about your child's interest to provide this. Right? We, our actions speak louder than our words, right? So those are the kinds of things that are my priorities. Um, I don't know how many of you know. Um, I, put my, I put my business on hold because uh, I didn't want any conflict because Austin ISD was my largest contributor. <laughs> I was a vendor in the district. So when we offer bus monitors and lunch monitors, think about combining those. I have four jobs, all at ACC. I work in ESL, I work with uh, college prep, I work with teacher certification, and I work with um, high school equivalency. I work in all those departments. Now, they don't even total 19 hours a week, and there's no benefits, but I get to do this because I serve 28 schools, and I can tell you that top of their mind is staffing, right? It's staffing. It's I can't, I can't do any more if I don't have it. Um, permanent subs, great idea. But we have to be able to train subs. We can't just bring Joe Bob's mama in and then let her loose on the kids. We have to say, if you come to Austin ISD, you require X amount of hours in cultural, uh, proficien pro excuse me, cultural uh, proficiency, um, inclusion, diversity, right? And then, we, and then maybe even a little um, training for them so that we can keep subs. I don't know if you know it, but Austin ISD substitutes have a Facebook page. They have a Facebook page where they share information and they say, hey, I'm actually going to be training some of them for free, right, in those best practices so that they can do good in their, um, I feel like that's an investment, right? 
that's an investment in our district. But those subs care so much that they actually joined the Facebook group and are doing outside sources. Like, oh, here's a podcast I found about substituting. I didn't even know there was a podcast about substituting, but there's several. So there's work we can do to support our schools because if, if people feel they can do the job, they'll come every day. But if at the end of the day they're pulling their hair out, they're only going to do that once or twice. And then now teachers can't do what they need to do. So those are my priorities that support. I don't know where that is in the budget, like if we have that, because we have like a lot of other different things, but I didn't see, I mean, I'm sure you're gonna like line item it out and everything. Also, the finally, one of my priorities is redundancy. Parents really want to know, because they think all of y'all make six figures. I think some of y'all like, get out of here. But that's what they think, and so we need to be really clear about where our money is going, and when something is not filled, like, what happens to that money? You know, I, people want to know that, and so however we can get that information to them in a clear, concise, easy-to-understand manner, I want to do that for them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other trustees? This was such a rich discussion. Um, I'm just going to add a couple quick things. One is I would love to have a conversation about the equity of our PPFT. Um, and how that works out, just re looking at who, you know, I know y'all are working on that. Would love to just get an update at the next budget conversation to see how that plays out. Um, I would love to know what it would take to have our SPED teachers be the highest paid SPED teachers and SPED staff in Central Texas. Like, I know we, our goal is to get all of our staff to be the highest paid, but SPED right now is our biggest need. So maybe there's a thought about investing even more in that group. Um, would love to have a further conversation on essential areas. Um, that is still a huge problem. People got tired of talking about it, but, so we're not hearing about it, but I know that there's still a lot of questions around it. The Panorama survey also was really telling um, on, on the efficacy of that approach. Uh, Title I, curious to know about that. And I would love us to spend a little time thinking about after school. I'm still thinking about that school changes document. <laughs> after school programming was like the big sell there. And that is also a big reason that charter kids are going to charter schools too. So I don't know if that's part of the conversation. Um, you don't have to answer any of this now, uh, but. It is. Okay, yeah. good. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, and then I want us to think about summer school programming. Um, and I don't know if that is something that, that you're, you and your staff have thought about, if, but like when you look at the research, that is another one of those huge return on investment things. And it's an equity thing. And so um, I don't know if that's something that y'all are considering. Um, the last thing is, can we please put some money in here to get paper report cards. <laughs> I know that sounds so silly, but um, I miss that. Parents tell me they miss it. And most I'll tell you, most of the parents I know, they don't even look at their kids' report cards anymore because it's too much of a pain to get into blend to find it. And it's hard to have this that conversation with your kid with a paper and say, well, what happened in English class? Or, you know, when you're looking at most of our parents, they don't even have a computer. They're looking off their little phone here. And if we want parents to be partners, as uh, Trustee Zapata was talking about, at the very least, they need to know how their kids are doing. And so um, that seems like a, a small expense, but we'd get so much return off of that. So thank you. And I know this is for so many conversations. Um, I do want to pause before we move on, because we had two topics from the president's report. One was a legislative update, and one was um, the superintendent search, and I know we've got the ESSER update, but I'm going to give you a chance to breathe um, so we can talk about those two items, and then we'll return and talk about ESSER. Thank you. By the way, I do want to say it's 846, and for us to get through a whole exec session by midnight, we have to be done here by like 910 or 915 ish. So let's talk fast. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, thank you, uh, President Singh. Uh, so just really quickly, an update on the superintendent search um, and a little bit of uh, revisiting of kind of like how we got here. So in November, um, trustee elects and sitting trustees reviewed and commented on the request for proposal, RFP, 
RFPs are essentially used when services need to be purchased or procured competitively. Um, December, so that happened in November. December 6th is when the RFP was posted publicly. So between December 6th and January 10th, search firms or vendors could submit their proposals. So the proposal basically means, and sorry, I'm talking to the public, not you all, you, you, you guys know this. Um, so the search firms could submit their proposals. The proposals essentially describes the way that they plan to help us search for and hire a permanent superintendent, um, and then the associated cost to those services that they propose. So we received five proposals during that time period, December 6th to January 10th. Um, so we received five proposals uh, the, on December 11th. I, along with Secretary Boswell and Trustees Hunter and Gonzalez, met to discuss next steps and set some dates. Um, the, each proposal is being reviewed by this review committee uh, of those trustees that I just named. So the review committee is, um, the expectation was that we would review all five proposals and submit our kind of scoring of those proposals by midnight today. We will then meet tomorrow, December 13th, um, to discuss the evaluation of the proposals that we reviewed and determine which two or three vendors um, will be invited to participate in oral presentations. So for those of y'all who don't live in procurement, which I really love, um, so oral presentations, uh, it's essentially an opportunity for the review committee to hear directly from the selected firms um, and receive information that clarifies different aspects of the services um, that we're seeking. The next important date is December 17th. Uh, that's when we will hear the oral presentations from the firms that are, that are selected for that uh, phase of the process. And then no later than December 23rd, um, the review committee will submit our recommend. Oh my God, thank you. Good Lord. What month am I in? Clearly 2022. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So yeah, uh, December 17th, is uh, January 17th is when we'll receive the oral presentations and no later than January 23rd is when we will submit our recommendations as to which search firm should be contracted, um, so basically hired. Uh, and then January 25th is when the board will vote on that recommendation. If approved, then negotiations and the contract can be executed. Um, so finalized, um, and then our best estimate is that um, services, so the search uh, for our permanent superintendent um, will begin in early February. If folks want more information, you can go to austinisd.org, click on Board of Trustees, scroll through the sub, the sub menu uh, until you see superintendent search. Thank you, Trustee Lugo. Trustee Bosman? <laughs> Uh, yes, so advocacy for in support of public education and in alignment with board adopted priorities is one of our jobs as trustees. And I have an update about the Texas legislative session and some other work that we're doing. The 88th session of the Texas legislature convened on Tuesday, two days ago. Uh, House members elected Representative Dade Phelan from Beaumont to serve a second term as speaker. Lawmakers have been filing bills since November 14th, and they have been busy. More than 1,750 bills have been filed to date, um, and the session is two days old. Uh, we're tracking more than 230 bills that relate to our legislative priorities and to public education. They include things about public school funding, vouchers, elections, charter schools, property taxes, and student discipline and safety. The next step in the legislative process is appointment of committees by the speaker and the lieutenant governor. We expect that to happen by the end of January or early February. Then we'll know um, who's on the education committees, which are the ones we interact with most, although we also interact with others. And once that's established, the pace will really pick up and um, we may be turning to some of you for testimony for other things, um, staff, students, families, other people in our community who have an interest in that. And we have trustees who will be testifying and engaging as well. On Monday, the controller announced that lawmakers will begin with a $32.7 billion with a B dollar surplus. That translates to having $188 billion to spend it for the next over the next two years. 
Um, the budget is a two-year a biennial budget. That's 26% more than they had two years ago. There's a spending limit of 12.33% above spending from the last biennium. That's a statute in Texas. It's our hope that the legislature will increase per pupil funding, the basic allotment, which will not only provide additional resources for students, but will also lower our recapture payment. And we are working on many, many other priorities that you can find on the website. Um, and if you want to be involved in supporting our legislative priorities, you can go to our website at austinisd.org slash legislature slash bills. You can see there which bills support our priorities. And you can contact your legislator, which you can also find on our website, and let them know whether you support or oppose the bills listed on the website if you have interest in that. Um, and we can also be sharing, we, we will also be reaching out to some people um, as things move forward and pick up speed. Um, we also have a new Austin ISD Advocacy Advisory Committee. Our first meeting will be Jan uh, February 1st in the evening, and that will launch early this year. It's a new district advisory body similar to the DAC or the SHAC. Our goal is to bring together a diverse mix of people from across the district, both internal and in the larger community. It will include a student from every campus, staff, families, big mix of people. Um, to help the board inform and amplify our advocacy of our adopted priorities. So this year, people will learn about how things are funded, learn where who makes decisions where, um, help us talk about our priorities, and then the next year, members who are with us this year will help us shape our legislative priorities for the upcoming, for the next session, the 89th session. Um, so there will be four meetings each year. The first will focus on learning about the current agenda, sharing information with the community and engaging with lawmakers. The second will center around shaping the advocacy for next session of the years. Um, that's how the years will work. Um, and our Texas legislature will be the main focus, but we also engage with city council, with the county, with federal um, advocacy. So we have a broad mix of things. Um, and we'll communicate between meetings to share opportunities for advocacy with people. Everyone who's interested should fill out an application which is available in English and Spanish on AISD's advisory body website. Um, and our first meeting will be February 1st from 5.30 to 7.30 here at Austin ISD headquarters. Our second will be March 29th at the Capitol, most likely at lunchtime from 11 to 1. And please, if you're interested, apply and um, we'll be naming members soon. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Boswell, and thank you for your leadership in getting this committee started. I'm really excited about that. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to mention that there was one comment um, that was not played uh, earlier this evening from um, Nadia Khan, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want folks to know that we're going to that comment has already been forwarded to all of us, and it's related to the enrollment plan for Marshall Middle School. So it's good stuff um, in that comment. All right, now where are we? Let's see. Thank you. Oh, the next item is the ESSER fund update. So uh, Mr. Segura and Mr. Ramos, could you please share that? Mr. Ramos, the floor is all yours. Is the presentation, can you all see the presentation? Not yet. Try it again. There we go. All right, Pres President Swink Singh, uh, Interim Superintendent Segura, members of the board. Uh, we wanted to give an update on our ESSER two and ESSER three funding uh, for both the 2023-2024 uh, fiscal year. And so uh, basically uh, ESSER 2, ESSER 3 funds were federal funds uh, that were given to school districts to address the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, we also received ESSER 1 funds. Uh, those basically were uh, supplanted funds uh, by the state. And so the funds that we re did receive from ESSER 1, uh, the state basically reduced the, their state share. And so we had to supplant uh, our budget that uh, specific year in 2020. And so we are going to go over uh, ESSER 2. The allocation Austin ISD received was 69.3 million. ESSER 3, 155.6 million dollars. And so 
we did uh, meet with our community as part of this process, and we did uh, come up with some uh, utilization and priorities uh, as part of our ESSER plan. Uh, those priorities included supporting teachers, uh, purchasing rigorous instructional materials, uh, learning uh, time for learning, including tutoring and enrichment opportunities uh, for our students, including uh, summer and after school programs, uh, empowering parents through counseling services, parent leadership training, wraparound, and community partnerships. And then we also included some funds for facility improvements, uh, including HVAC, ventilation, uh, PPE equipment, and, and new technology as well. So the categories that we as a district chose uh, with regards to ESSER II funds uh, included uh, several departments, uh, categories in academics and school leadership, enrollment, engagement, technology, facilities. Uh, we did uh, uh, give a vaccine incentive using ESSER II funds. Uh, we also used part of these funds to supplant our budget uh, last year uh, and this year's, well, last year. And then we also used uh, funds for indirect costs, which is one of the allowed uh, uses for ESSER. Two funds. With ESSER three funds, similar categories, academics and school leadership receive funds, uh, enrollment engagement, technology, uh, our budget and planning team. Uh, we did uh, use these funds for staff retention, uh, both last year and this year. Uh, state and federal uh, department also received a minimal amount of funds. We used these funds to supplant our budget as well and then indirect costs uh, with ESSER three funds. With regards to ESSER II and the vaccine incentive, uh, back in October 15th of 2021, uh, we did a one-time incentive of $250 for every eligible employee that was fully vaccinated. And so we invested $3.3 million uh, specifically for that vaccine incentive program. Also, we did use, again, uh, ESSER III for staff retention stipends. Uh, specifically, uh, we paid our first uh, $10 million uh, dollar staff retention stipend November of 2022. Uh, we are paying a second amount in March of 2023. These were strategically timed so that our staff can receive uh, a $1,000 stipend if they were full time right before uh, the uh, Thanksgiving holidays and then they will receive an additional $1,000 right before spring break uh, timed uh, uh, for that purpose. We also used uh, retention and uh, stipends for long-term and hard-to-fill positions in the district, 751,000 uh, for multi-grade level uh, stipends uh, throughout the district. Our novice teachers, uh, support specialists, 930,000. Uh, classrooms that had 25 or more students, we gave teachers the option uh, whether we uh, looked at an additional position or they maintained uh, the 25 students uh, with a, a stipend uh, uh, that they would receive if they took that option. And so uh, we had many teachers that preferred to, I believe it was a $3,000 stipend that they would receive uh, if they took on uh, students at 25 or more. Uh, over five years, uh, if uh, teachers, uh, librarians and counselors had over five years uh, experience, 1.6 million, and then the uh, student teacher initiative, uh, $75,000 for that program. So total incentives, uh, 23.6 million out of ESSER three funding. We also, one of the requirements with ESSER three is that we must spend at least 20% of our total allocation for learning loss. And so uh, Aust Austin ISD did spend uh, that with supplanting our budget that qualifies uh, for learning loss, professional development, classroom <coughs> staff and instruction support, mental health and behavioral supports and technology as well uh, that did qualify uh, for the learning loss program. Uh, here are more specifics on exactly where we spent uh, these funds uh, to address the learning loss. Total funds uh, that we spent out of ESSER 3, uh, uh, 48.9 million, uh, which address 31.45% uh, uh, for learning loss. So we do meet that requirement now. Uh, and we are continuing to look at opportunities uh, to spend funds in these areas. Uh, professional development included uh, uh, funds expended for reading academies, uh, high quality instructional materials, dyslexia training, and professional development. Uh, classroom staff support, uh, the funds were used uh, to support a novice teacher uh, support specialists, classroom tutors, after school enrichment programs, and instructional coaching and leadership. Uh, with regards to technology and how we use these funds, uh, we purchased devices, uh, infrastructure was upgraded, uh, we included a learning management system, uh, digital tools uh, were purchased, and educational applications and softwares uh, were improved in the district. 
mental health and behavioral supports included expenditures in uh, mental health professionals, at-risk coordinators, additional counseling services, teacher training and programming, and wraparound and community partnerships. And the facilities and operations use their funds for ventilation systems, uh, janitorial supplies and equipment, and HVAC systems throughout the district. So this basically is a breakdown of how ESSER II funds were expended uh, year by year uh, and in, in specific categories. So uh, the majority of the funds were expended or have been expended uh, in payroll and professional contracted services. Uh, so that's just a graphical of where we uh, have spent uh, our funds based on object uh, codes. And then ESSER III funds, uh, we are in the year two of a three-year period to spend ESSER III funds. Uh, the majority of these funds are expended in payroll. You heard about the retention uh, incentives for employees. Uh, this is the second year. Next year would be the last year uh, that we have to spend these funds. So uh, in looking at our uh, uh, budgets and our targets, we are on target to expend these funds by the end of next year. And so currently ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, the percentage is spent. Uh, you'll see ESSER $3, we are at 28% uh, uh, by the end of this fiscal year. ESSER 2, uh, we're looking at 78%. Uh, these numbers are through uh, November. And so we, again, uh, based on these percentages, we are confident that we will expend these funds within the given time frame that we are uh, given by the federal government. And then these are just estimated uh, budgets uh, for uh, next year. Uh, where we have academics and school leadership. They have uh, $15 uh, million allocated to be expended next year. Enrollment and engagement, $2 million. Technology, $7 million. Uh, budget and planning, $113,000. Uh, supplanting, $8.6 million. Uh, so we are uh, planning to expend uh, next year uh, $32.7 million out of ESSER III. And I know that was a quick presentation, but I open it up to questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. Um, trustees, are there any questions? Yes, Trustee Lugo. All right, just really quickly, um, thank you for the quick rundown. I would be interested to know, and maybe it exists somewhere, um, like breaking this down by campus or by, you know, somehow putting some context to this, because um, if I were a cynic, I'd be like, oh, this sounds great, but um, I don't see it at my campus, right? And that may not be true, but it just, it would help to have some background information so that folks could see, like, no, really, this, you know, here, these are the three things that happened at your campus, and here, right? So that would be my request. Thank you, We, we can gather that data. Great. All right. Um, oh, yes, Dr. Kaufman. Yes, again, thank you for, this, for the update on the ESSER funding. I had a couple questions. Um, one, um, how have the ESSER funds been used to accelerate student learning or to add time for learning specifically for all students receiving special education services? Okay. So I don't know if someone from uh, academics can answer that question. Good evening, President Singh, Interim Superintendent Segura, Dr. Kaufman. To your question, we have funded House Bill 4545 tutoring out of ESSER 2 last year, ESSER 3 this year. And to your question, Trustee Lugo, each campus got a specific allotment. This year, we funded at a higher level. So it, previously, we funded just at the does not meets level. This year when we ran numbers and looked at it, we said, let's look at everybody who sort of using some metric, right? Like you have to decide allocations in some way. So we used um, a, a larger percentage of students and funded. And so any student is available to get the tutoring via House Bill 4545. They can get the supplemental tutoring. Campuses can also procure additional materials and additional resources to use on their campus. We're also strategic with giving some guidance around these are approved vendors, but you might also consider using your ESSER this way and using then using your title in a separate way so that you can get the resources and materials you need for different student groups and have it very, be very tailored. 
Okay, so, but there's no special provisions to ensure that that some of our most um, marginalized student groups, like our students receiving special education or others, are benefiting from those funds? It's campus decisions based on their data? It is completely based on campus decisions based on the data that they have in front of them right now and throughout the year. So we did initial fundings based on last year's STAR, and that is what we also did the year before, well, using SCAs as well. And this year, when campuses got their funds, they can spend them how they how, spend the funds how they want on their campus. Okay, and we did have some ESY programs, so correct that were designated for like life skills or for for um, early childhood education. Are were any funds designated to provide such programming for, for instance, for other students in receiving special education? Yes, so services? we also funded summer programs. There was summer school last year. And then there's always the ongoing summer schools that we have, and I, I do believe Dr. Williams' um, team is here as well. And we gave them the percentage of ESSER funds so that they could fund and run the summer school programs there as well. And specifically for special education supports, uh, for this uh, school year we did budget $1.9 million. Uh, that included uh, supports for Go Book, uh, Teach Town, uh, Text and Write, and the and to why unique learning system uh, for the special ed department. Okay, I, I would like to follow up offline um, sometime soon just regarding the allocation of funds <laughs> specifically for the special education programming, if I could. Um, I also wanted to ask um, whether the ESSER funds permit districts to create full-time positions. They do. Uh, and so as part of our ESSER plan, uh, when the ESSER plans were created by the district, one of the things that uh, the district was uh, wanting to be careful with was creating a funding cliff. And so if we funded too many positions out of ESSER funding uh, in the 23-24 school year, once these funds ran out, uh, then we would have a huge budget uh, deficit or a budget hole in, that needed to be filled uh, because we hired uh, ongoing uh, cost versus one-time cost. And so we were very careful with that and limited uh, the number of FTEs that we created out of ESSER. But yes, uh, positions can be funded using ESSER funds. Okay, I mean, so that's something I would just ask that we reconsider as well, given our attrition rates and given the fact that these funds are designated to address a crisis, mm -hmm. right? That they were intended to address a crisis, um, that we think carefully about where we could use extra staffing in the midst of a crisis, knowing that through attrition, there will be positions for people next year. Thank you, Trustee Kaufman. Anyone else? Yes, Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you for this. I appreciate the update and the conversation. Um, I would love to know, and, and you don't have to share it now unless it's uh, readily available to you, but just how are we measuring the success of these investments so we know if any of this is something that we want to continue? And are there any things that have been especially high impact from this that we've seen a really measurable difference in enrollment, attendance, academics, and mental health, you know, kind of what what do we see here that may be working especially well that we want to take, learn from, maybe advocate for, replicate? Um, are we doing that work to find out how this is having an impact? So, so I do know the first part of this process and program was to identify uh, needs within the district. Uh, the next step is to uh, measure if uh, how we spent these funds uh, really met our goals and, and improved student outcomes, uh, accomplished what we felt they were going to accomplish. So that's the next step that we have to analyze the data. And so that's the next step that we will take as part of uh, this process. Thank you. And then I have a question. Uh, I know a great deal of this was spent on technology devices and also software. Um, and I'm, I have some concerns, um, we talked about concern about funding cliff with staffing, and I have some concerns about funding cliff with programs. I know during uh, COVID we greatly expanded our use of technology and, um, you know, think that we just need to have a conversation together about what ongoing costs we've incurred, um, not only for technology and software that's supporting students, but for, for you know, um, the check-in for staff, the, the sign-in system, the, you know, kind of all these different 
um, there was at one point the social media monitoring um, that I would love an update on. So kind of what are what have we brought in um, and do we need, just because we have had it, do we need to continue with all of it? What might be duplicative? What um, where might we find some savings? So I would really love to take a really, have a really good analysis of everything new that came in and whether we feel like it's giving us value. Okay. Um, we can get that. I think right. that would be a very important part of our budget conversation, not just, um, I think partly do we want to continue spending extra dollars on that next, you know, as we spend it down and with budgeting, is that something we wanna invest in over the long term? And what does that really mean for us? So I appreciate that. And I think that gets back to the question of one-to-one. Of -one. I know our bond has funded, that funded it, but do we believe we need one-to-one -one devices in kindergarten? Do we need, you know, do kids need to be on computers all day long? Um, you know, kind of what are we doing with that? And what software costs are associated with that hardware cost as well? Um, so thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate Trustee Singh's question earlier about summer programs and really high quality summer programs. And I know many districts have invested at uh, ESSER dollars in very high quality, rich, um, not just academic catch up, but, but really a whole full rich program that also has the benefit of helping students um, stay on track academically and catch up on some of that lost learning. So I would love to know if, if we're thinking differently about that this year. I know the first year of ESSER, the thought was um, our educators were exhausted and, and the choice was to not use it that way. But is this an opportunity maybe this coming summer to rethink some of those ESSER dollars, um, maybe to turn to that? And has there been any thought about um, redeploying anything, changes to the plan right now based on um, best practices in other places based on going back to the community maybe and saying what would you like to see that we haven't done that community <laughs> survey was a very long time ago um, you know are we are we thinking um, based on what we've learned locally and from other districts of, of redeploying any of that before it runs out so I can speak to the summer school specifically so dr. Diaz and her team is working on a wonderful summer school program that is really based more on enrichment and extension as opposed to this idea of remediation. Because we all have been learners at certain times where you don't wanna just come and sit and relearn what you didn't get. We wanna see that sort of relevant pieces to our lives that's exciting, that makes summer fun. And we've all had those experiences, I hope. And if we haven't, we wanna be able to give those to students where you're, you learned in a different way and it was still, summer school was this beautiful, wonderful thing where you're like, I built a tree house, and we were joking, we were on the second floor yesterday, like someone should build a summer, a tree house outside of this window, and I was like, add that to the summer school <laughs> curriculum. Like, that would be amazing. You yes, could be please. sitting out there, and then what, look into the second, um, second floor meeting room. So things like that, where we really do want to make sure that learning comes alive, and if you're coming to summer school, it should be that, all, all learning should be that project-based, problem-based, highly engaging and relevant to your life. And so Dr. Diaz and her team are working on rewriting that. And so our hope is that this year, especially if you come to those first 10 days of summer school, that it isn't just a sit and get, let me show you what you didn't learn, let me reteach, let me, we want it to be this fun experience. So our, that's what our hope and aim for is for this year. And we're super excited about it. I wish she was here to talk more about it because it's going to be a great time. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, I would love an invitation to come see that. So. You can come build the tree house Thank with you. Us. Awesome. I would love that. <laughs> invitation to be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Um, and then I have one other um, question and, and comment. Uh, you know, I understand that trustees don't need to approve us for funding, that it's in a different category. Um, but I know in October we got a notice that $300,000 of ESSER funding was added to a contract the board had approved for $650,000. It was almost a 50% increase um, to make videos about each campus for enrollment purposes. Um, and, and I know it could be done. It wasn't illicit. It wasn't against the rules. But I'm not sure it fully aligned with our values to do that. And I would really love... Um, I've asked a question in the tracker about that contract specifically, but if ESSER funds are being used in ways um, that feel more like just a source of cash for something rather than really strategically, um, I would of something we have already taken a vote on, I would love some 
conversation about that. I think if that's going to happen in the future, I would appreciate that. Um, because I, I voted for that at $650,000, feeling like it was quite expensive. Um, and I would not have chosen to vote for that at $950,000. Um, I have real questions about the benefit of that. And, and if it's something that we have already taken action on in that very specific way, I would really value the chance. And, and I can't speak for my colleagues, but I can speak for myself to have a chance just to know that that's coming and be partners in those decisions, if that would be appropriate. So thank you for that. I was going to say, uh, Trustee Boswell, I can certainly get the details and provide kind of a, a, a an overview of how we got to this point. I don't have all the details in front of me and don't know all the details, but I can certainly get them. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've put it in the tracker and I trust that yep. it will come. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I believe this ends uh, the section of the information reports from the administration, so thank you both very much. Um, at this time, we will now move into the preview of the upcoming regular board agendas, and this will allow the public and trustees the to have the opportunity to review the agenda items that will be considered for a vote at the next regular board meeting, and um, our staff are available to answer any questions for tonight's preview. So we'll begin with agenda item seven, which is, um, the preview for academics and curriculum trustees. Are there any questions on this item? Okay. All right, the next section is eight, board administration. Trustees, are there any questions on these items? One is related to the approval of the exec search firm, and um, 8.2 is the authorization of the board's ad hoc committee on special education. And we'll be talking more about that one in executive session tonight. All right, the next section is nine, business and finance. Trustees, are there any questions on these items related to 9.1, which is the approval of the agreement for the Greater Austin Area Telecommunications Network, um, approval of an agreement for student placement for a residential school, and um, the monthly financial report for November 2022. Yes, Trustee Foster. So item 9.2, appears on our consent agenda, the agreement for a student placement for a residential school. And I'm assuming that item, it has to do with the dollar amount associated with it as to why, or I guess why is that, why, why is that on our uh, consent agenda as, as an item to vote on? Jacob, will you? Uh, that, the, thank you, Trustee Foster. Uh, that agreement is for a contract with a residential facility that meets our threshold mm -hmm. under our board policy for board approval. So can you share the dollar amount associated or the anticipated dollar amount associated with this, the ballpark? Um, the ballpark is around 300000 300000 Over multiple years. 300000 per year? No, over multiple years. No, I'm, I'm sorry, if you don't mind, can I ask uh, Dr. Robinette to help me with that one? <clears throat> Trustee Foster, this is connected to, um, and, and, and members of the board, um, this is connected to um, discussions in executive session with mm -hmm. part of the prior board. Um, at the time um, as well. Um, it will exceed, it is due to the threshold of that amount. Um, some of that uh, residential is complete in full-time care for, um, uh, um, for a student. Um, and and um, that residential piece would, the cost estimate that was proposed and shared um, earlier in executive session, um, <clears throat> for that care, therapeutic services, et cetera, associated with that, um, runs closer to about 400,000, 400 and something thousand mm -hmm. um, per year, yeah. 365 days. So we, we've, we find ourselves in a, in a difficult circumstance in that we, and I wanna be mindful of, of sort of privacy and so I, I don't want to get you know sort of too specific, but part of our reality is that 
in our district, we have an ethos. We, 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 we want to take care of our students. And we find ourselves in, in the, the, the very challenging reality where the care of an individual student is likely to be north of $400,000 per year for an individual student. And I, I've, I've been wrestling and thinking about this for a couple, I guess, at least weeks, if not months now, um, where you all have been doing the work of trying to see, can we accommodate the needs of a student? The residential placement comes in because there's a sense that this is a circumstance where we cannot meet the needs. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the ethics and the dilemma of $400,000 for an, an individual student makes me wonder, do we have to keep working for an alternative um, solution? Um, or do we want to state as our value that no cost is too high and we're willing to spend $400,000 uh, for a student. I, I realize this is not a, a popular or comfortable conversation, but I'm, I'm wrestling with this. And um, where we are with special education and where we are with the delivery of services for all of our students is such that we have to obviously find a balance. Um, so I wanted this uh, item lifted up and and discussed openly, even if uh, painfully. So I guess I don't have more questions beyond the dollar amount, which I, we now know to be $400,000 per year. Um, maybe in executive session, there can be additional conversation about other mitigants, other ways to get this done. But at this point, I'm not super, super comfortable with where we are. So, uh, Trustee Foster, um, one of the things that I certainly recognize is, is the amount per people tied to this um, agenda item. One of the things that I did ask the team was to um, help me understand you know, how we got here. And I think many of those details will have to be shared in executive session, but I can tell you that this is essentially the, the last option. We, we have exhausted and looked and tried for a very for a period of time to find a solution that could work, uh, but we have an obligation to the student and we are going to fulfill it, um, and we don't have the resources to do that here. Um, and unfortunately, that's, the, that's where we are. This happens. Um, I did get um, guidance from other school districts. It, it does happen, and, and, it, and it will happen again. Um, so you know, for that, for whatever that's worth, it, it is something that um, we don't take lightly, but it is something that Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to to address it in any different way. So, part and and that's that's actually helpful. So, you know, part of it might be a sort of expanded complex matrix where we say here's what we do on average per student, and understanding that some students that you know the measly basic allotment from the state is enough to magically get it done. Right and things exist on a spectrum and that we're gonna have so many students at this threshold, so many at this, and this is the outlying case, and it's something that we can account for and have accounted for in the work that we do. But at that dollar amount, I guess I'd have to hear that and understand that to be the case, that this is something that we have responsibly accounted for or can account for in, in our work. So that would actually be helpful. Yeah, I, I look forward for to continued conversation and executive session around the specific specifics um, that was afforded to um, the prior trustees and the entirety of the board and any questions that you may have um, on the very unique circumstances that are um, in this this particular case um, and likewise um, pretty pretty unprecedented circumstances for our school district. Um, and at the same time, any and all efforts to look at um, the requirements under federal law, um, IDEA, and um, looking at anything um, and everything for us to be able to provide um, services for 
um, this individual child and some of the unique circumstances that prevent us um, highly unique circumstances without going into that. I also wanted to say that there is a small portion um, or there is a portion of funds through the um, Office of uh, Special Population of non-public uh, non school and high cost programs. And that's why other districts mentioned to you that we um, will be submitting an application to the state for any reimbursement that is allowable. Um, and um, Dr. Rocha Gill, our executive director who has extensive experience in special education, there are some limits um, to their overall pot for the year if you will, and so the timeliness of that request sometimes comes into play, but once we have that established, then we will immediately reapply for any of the out years. Mm -hmm. um, um, likewise, in any case um, where there is um, such a provision, um, there is both an obligation and an opportunity for us to have um, a connection each year. Um, to, to Dr. Reach's uh, earlier point, um, to participate fully in any of the um, in any of the the meetings with that not only the entity but with the R committee and where that is going to be provided to see if um, there's been any ability for us to then be able to provide a least restrictive environment here in our school district if there is improvement in any way for the individual specifics of this case Thank and we'll you. do that annually and and I just want to I guess just finally and, and I apologize for belaboring or, or drawing this out. I want to thank you and our entire team for uh, this is really difficult work. And every time you come to us with this challenging stuff, what I immediately see is how much hard work goes behind it. And so I don't take it lightly, and I'm not attempting to be flippant or light or or you know it's not it's not it's not pleasant to put to to be talking dollars. So what I really appreciate about y'all and even in what interim superintendent Segura said, he said, we have a responsibility to a kid, to a student. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to meet. So thank you for that, that sort of North Star, even as I engage this painful thing of mentioning numbers. No, I appreciate that, Trustee uh, Foster. And um, it allows us to, um, even in an uncomfortable conversation, to show not only that commitment, but to educate our public that these are sometimes are very unique circumstances um, that we need to address. Um, and we want to address the unique circumstances to the extent that we can right here in Austin ISD for any and all of our students as a priority one. That's our real North Star. Um, and that is going to be our hope for um, stability to happen in this particular case longer term so that we can um, in the future be able to see some progress in order to do that. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Yes, Dr. Kaufman. I, I just want to ask for that item. Um, I, I echo the appreciation for the work that your team is doing. And I also um, fully recognize the importance of our providing you know, a free and appropriate public education for all students, regardless of cost, and that's part of the price of equity, is that some students cost more to educate than others, and that's what we have to recognize. So um, I appreciate that we're providing that option for a student who needs it. Um, I just want to clarify what we're, before the meeting next, in two weeks, what are we approving? It's unclear from this document to me if we're approving you know, it mentions students qualify, but I hear it was talking about one student. It mentioned, it doesn't identify the provider or the cost. And so I just really want to make sure that I'm clear. Are we approving a contract of a particular provider and it, it's coming it, to board approval because it's over the $100,000 mark? Or what is it that the board is approving? I don't need an answer right now, but I would like to just be clear on that before great. we vote next time. Absolutely. Thank we can you. talk about that exact. Thank you. Yeah, and we can. what we can maybe do is schedule an exec session next time at the voting meeting before we actually vote on this item if there are remaining questions. So thank you, trustees. And, but for purpose of the public, just to be clear that the agenda item is for sure accurate yes. and specific around what it is, Correct. barring the confidential thank information. That's, thank you for raising that. Okay. So the next section is um, 11. 
Oh, no, I'm sorry, 10, which is community engagement. Um, and this one's kind of cool, so I'm going to take uh, privilege and just kind of read what this one's about. Um, this is the Menchaca Elementary School Campus Advisory Committee unanimously voted in favor of naming the road as Jack and Mary Dodson Way. Jack and Mary Dodson were the original landowners in the mid-1800s who were freed slaves, and they purchased over 100 acres during re Reconstruction, and their home is at um, Pioneer Farms. Their descendants donated the land to the district in 1967 to build the campus, which I think is amazing. The descendants of freed slaves donated their land to AISD. That's, that's history. That's worth um, learning. So <clears throat> there are any questions on that one? All right. Um, the next section is 11 facilities. Um, trustees, are there any questions on, these, on any of these items? Okay, well, thank you. The next is uh, section 12, human resources. As we move to these items, the board would like to ask the administration if they could share briefly <laughs> some additional information <laughs> on the three consultation agreements that the district and Education Austin have been working on and which the board will look to um, ratify at our voting meeting. So Mr. Seguda. I'd love to ask uh, Ms. Sosak, our chief human capital officer, to provide a quick overview uh, of these three <laughs> consultation agreements. <laughs> Good evening again, Board of Trustees, President Singh, Interim Superintendent Segura. Thank you for having me. Um, I would like to give a little bit of background, first of all, on really what a consultation agreement is. Uh, so uh, the elected consultation agent for the district is Education Austin. We meet with them once a month to discuss various issues as it relates to um, different em employment um, factors. For example, we talk about compensation, we talk about benefits, we talk about working conditions, we talk about staffing, we talk about all of these, these items. And uh, I'm very proud to say that we have a wonderful relationship uh, and we have fantastic conversation and great banter and dialogue. And Ken, I know you're listening. So, um, uh, but, but a rich, rich discussion. And so at the end of the day, everybody around the table wants to do what is best for our employees. And that's what this is about, is, is finding that, that space. So, um, Jacob, I think I hit the right button here, but um, I will wait to see if there's a magical. There you go. It's, it's magic. It just happens. OK. So um, we have three that we have um, talked through with, ed with Education Austin and uh, will be up for board approval in a couple of weeks. And so we just wanted to review those with you tonight. Uh, the first one is required time for teachers beyond the duty day. I, I'm going to track it back to what we were talking about earlier. It's not just about compensation. It's about making the job um, doable. And, and how can we? Uh, make sure that our that our teachers are um, protected in such a way that that it's not continuing to pile on in the last few years it has felt very much like that this is actually it, it really is a, um, uh, a an, an older agreement that was already on the books it is really to include um, when, when I was a teacher, we called it tutoring. Uh, if I was having to, to catch students up, they, they missed work, uh, they, they had missing work, they were absent from class, et cetera. We kind of refer to this as office hours now um, because tutoring often takes on the connotation of when we talk about House Bill 4545 tutoring, and I don't want to those, confuse those two things. But really, this is just um, an amended consultation agreement to include uh, office hours and or tutoring, however you'd like to refer to it, to a limited amount of time. So uh, there was a point in time, again, when I was a teacher, I remember my principal very clearly saying, please tell me the two hours before school that you'd like to spend tutoring students and the two hours after school that you'd like, and post those. That was in 2005, six, seven, and, and the world looks very different now. Um, and, and what teachers are having to navigate now is, is very different. And so we should be, uh, compensating our teachers above and beyond when if we're going to make requirements to that degree so we're trying to put limits on this 
um, and the limit has not changed. It works out to four hours per month, one hour per week of, of time outside of the duty day that you can be required to do any of these various activities not to exceed an hour without compensation. Okay. All right, 12.2, we're going to talk to, uh, this meeting moratorium, it's very quick. Uh, basically, it is to, is to make sure that we do not schedule uh, any faculty meetings um, or, or ask teachers to attend any PLCs during the week of parent-teacher, uh, 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 what am I trying to say, uh, conferences. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we're protecting their time so that they can plan. And finally, um, uh, one that we are very proud of uh, is a, re uh, a revised um, substitute coverage consultation agreement. It is reintroducing the ability to allow our elementary teachers to receive additional compensation when we are not able to procure a sub. Unfortunately, that is the case sometimes. And we have five students going to classroom A, five going to classroom B, five going to classroom C. It is an extra duty and uh, an extra challenge for that teacher mm -hmm. and to be able to compensate fairly for that. Um, and so it is just reintroducing that as a factor. And it further clarifies what TAs uh, are able to be compensated and which TAs we can we can pull to do what. And I will stop there. Question. Yes, question. <clears throat> On 12.3, when yes, you, um, so I'm kindergarten teacher and six kids come into my room, how does that get in the system? Yes, ma'am. So our substitute office works with the substitute coordinator on that campus. Uh, that substitute coordinator is to track on this day, teacher so-and-so is not able to be here, we couldn't get a sub, we divided the kids between three or four teachers and we keep it on a track uh, on a tracker and we enter it into, into the payroll system and so it's from sub coordinator to sub office to payroll. That's a lot of people, it a lot is. of error. So I know that one area where we really struggle is getting people um, what, they're what they're due, their compensation in a timely manner. And I will just tell you, Dr. Thomas, it took me 15 months one time to get $300. So I'm just wondering what system that you have already or one that maybe we needed some funds or needs to be in there somewhere for that where we can track it better than asking a person to put it on an Excel spreadsheet and then can it not be, what's the thing we used to put our time into? I don't even know what it's called. Kronos, there's ASAP. There's I don't, do they still use both? I don't know. Can, is there any way, and I always used to forget, so I used to have to ask somebody. That's okay. It'd be seven o'clock at night and I'll be like, oh, I tutored after school. <laughs> uh, so we are entering into a new employee management platform. Mm -hmm. um, some of its functionality is still a little bit um, of an enigma to me on what it's going to be able to do and what it will not be able to do. I would love to be able to say, yes, it's going to be able to handle it and spit it right back out. There's going to be some onboarding with that and some tweaking to that that we're going to need to do. I am hopeful. Um, I will say, however, that I do apologize for the for the delay in the $300. However, I really do think that 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 because, because our sub coordinators are so, first of all, grateful that our teachers are able to cover in this fashion, like it really is a little bit faster. I do think that when it is tied to local dollars, it moves faster than it does if obviously it's moving through grant or title dollars. So that, that there's a little bit different workflow there. So these are local dollars and it does tend to move quite quickly, but you're right. But anytime that we receive an error or that we're alerted and we know about it, we fix it as fast as we can. Yeah, I remember when I told you I worked for ACC, I, I literally have in work day four different payroll yes, sheets and I have to you know, go in and say, what, who am I working for today so they can be tracked so that if I don't get my money, I, like, I know who didn't approve it because that's to go to four different supervisors. If we don't have that now, that's just something I think we have to look at just because if you're, like when I was at Sadler Means, I was the head of collegium. I was the, believe it or not, the pep squad coach. And I was over student council. I had, I mean, I was making, I had a lot of different things, yes, right? And so when that happens, like sometimes it would be like months before I realized I was missing like $200 or whatever. And you're right, when it's local, it's easier because the other money was tips money. But um, I just think that if we can get there where teachers can 
even just take a badge and say I'm scanning it. I don't I don't know how y'all would do it or whatever. But a, a way for them to have ownership of their time in and out. And first of all, being a teacher, nobody wants to clock in and out. I mean, I hated that. That's why I was a professional, so I didn't have to clock in and out. But if they can maybe even just keep track of it somewhere for yes, themselves, I think maybe that would be helpful. Yes, so that at the end of the day, they can say I did get all of back what I put in. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, am I the only one who remembers having to fill out the supplemental time on a no. large piece of paper with <laughs> a red, red pen? With the red, red pen. pen. <laughs> with the red pen, yes. Um, on the first, um, on nine point, you're on the first one that you described? Yes, on the, I don't know, I have in front of me. Is, what changed? The number of hours no, sir. per month? Just, add just, a, just adding just in the, the words tutoring and office hours. Okay, so just those two words changed. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, Trustee Gonzalez. Um, I want to reiterate what uh, Trustee Hunter said. I completely agree. I can remember my, it's really a, quite a feat to watch a front office secretary like handle substitutes at the beginning of the morning, give tardy passes to kids, receive parents, give passes. Like it's a lot of different things. And I know as a teacher, because I think this has been in effect for a couple years, right, that, that you get compensated for, that if sometimes if I didn't get it, like it just wasn't worth the trouble to, to have to go and speak to whoever the sub campus, whoever the campus sub coordinator was. Um, and so while I understand that there, there are ways to fix that problem and get that money back, I would love to see it taken care of on the front end so that there's a really clear, easy system. Um, and then the other question that I have about 12.3 is I think it was in section four on, on letter E uh, that um, other these other categories of employees are excluded from the agreement. I just, I don't feel good about not um, having librarians as part of that agreement. I mean, I remember the one-to-one -one rollout when that happened, right? And then a lot of responsibility shifted onto the librarians for replacing Chromebooks, for dealing with chargers that broke down all the time, especially once kids came back, you know, in person from the pandemic. And so, I, in addition to that, I also know that the libraries were used during COVID to hold classes when there were multiple classes that, that had substitutes. Um, and I know that that's an ongoing practice still. And so I'm just curious as to why um, I'm seeing all of these increased responsibilities on in the roles of librarians, including monitoring multiple classrooms at a time, and yet they're excluded from this agreement. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez, for the question. Uh, it is a question and a point that was raised multiple times during consultation. And so here's the rationale for why. It is, it is so important for our, for our campuses to have fully functioning libraries and the librarian to be a librarian. And when you open the door for using the librarian as a sub, your librarian just became a permanent sub. And so it is to actually protect the librarian to be able to run that library. And so as clear as day to our principals, we've given you, well, first of all, our first hope is that you procure, procure a sub. <laughs> Secondly, we're compensating teachers, compensating TAs. There's so many different routes to continue to have a functioning library and not go down that road. Now, if we have exhausted every single option and we are in some sort of bind that there's no other way to do it, then that's a different conversation. And Ken Zarephus and I have had that conversation, but I personally feel that a, librarian is, a library is such um, an important function for a campus that it will be, um, it will deteriorate that program and be used because it's such an easy go-to for that and we don't want that to happen. I, I agree and so I'm just gonna um, channel um, Trustee Anderson here and ask who's gonna monitor that? Uh, you know, because we're saying that that's not gonna be the case and I know that like yesterday, Mr. Hicks it was uh, the case, you know? <laughs> uh, Mr. Hicks and I actually have had a conversation about that and, and Mr. Hicks is, is in agreement that, that is absolutely something that we will hammer home with our principals and make sure that they know that, that, is, that that's not the option there. Um, there. There are other options to be had. Okay, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Did you want to say something, Mr. Sayula? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. I have a quick question. Oh, yes. Um, are there any campuses that are exempt from this? Like any, um, like only Mendes? Mendes isn't under our, our oh. purview for staffing, so yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I love how everyone spoke so fast. <laughs> or, uh, okay, so the next section is, thank you so much. Um, the next section is 13 policy. So Mr. Seguda, before we open for questions on this item, could the administration share an overview of the calendar changes we're Absolutely. considering? Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Reach, could you please provide an update on the school calendar for 2023-2024? Happy to, and if I could get my slides back up, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Singh, Interim Superintendent Segura, and Board of Trustees. Um, so what I'm sharing with you tonight is proposed changes to the 2023-2024 district calendar. So that's for the calendar upcoming. As a reminder, the Board of Trustees actually approved um, the calendar for this year and the calendar for next year in December of 2021. Um, so this would be amending those changes that were already made. And um, I, I always like to start with a couple of items that we really need to understand when we think about a calendar. And I'm gonna go through this quick. I'm not gonna read everything here, but I wanna mention the two at the top. And that's that when we build a calendar, we need to take into consideration the minutes of instruction, which is a requirement from TEA, it used to be days, it's now minutes, and teacher contract days of 187. So that's kind of like our, our big guardrails. Um, so, uh, for, as I mentioned, in December 20, 2021, uh, we approved calendars, and it did have some changes that were different than what we have done as a district in the past. And they, they were focused around things that our human capital team had heard from employees, and we wanted to try some of those different items. We just recently, uh, and I apologize, I'm going to forget my exact date, so I think it was about two months ago, had a parent-teacher conference evening. Um, which was one of the changes and the feedback that we heard from our elementary teachers and from some of our families from our elementary teachers that it did not work as intended. It was not, um, it, it, it did not provide that same level of connection with our parents and really accomplishing what the original goal was. And, and we started hearing some of this feedback. And so a little bit of time went by and Ms. Hosack and I were talking and we were saying, you know, we've heard this. Maybe we need to see what else we're hearing on the calendar and see if there's anything that we may want to suggest for adjusting. Um, and so this brought us to about mid-November, and we decided to do some outreach. Um, I went and met with our District Advisory Council. I met with the Equity Advisory Council. I met with Education Austin. I met with um, a group of principals and administrators, which we call AAPSA. Um, and then I also met with our superintendent teacher round or one of my colleagues met with the superintendent teacher round table and I met with the principal superintendent round table and we gathered feedback from all those different groups and listened to what they thought on some of these changes and uh, after taking all of that feedback uh, we do want to make some proposed changes for the calendar for 23 24 and I have them written up here and I've kind of broken them down uh, so what you see first is kind of what we have as of now, and then what you see in red is the changes that we would be asking to amend. So um, the parent-teacher conference evening, evenings, we wanna go back to the elementary parent-teacher conference day, secondary professional development day. And so we would change the September 27th and 28th evening to a single day on Monday, September 25th. And then another thing that we had heard, and uh, this was also uh, discussed when, we, when I met with the Equity Advisory Council, was how we look at the days we select and how they could align with celebrating some of the, the rich holidays and celebrations that we have for our families and our staff and in this community. And so um, just looking at our calendar, we saw that there was some room to actually align these days with some of these important holidays. And uh, not only are we proposing potentially um, those being those student holidays, but also ensuring that we as a district are building up to those days. So it's not just you're off for September 25th, or it's not just that you're off for Yom Kippur. It's actually providing some, some nod, some education of here's what Yom Kippur is, so that we're tying it back into our education mission. And that's something that we wanna commit to if we look at doing something like this. 
Uh, so that's our first change. I do recognize that we heard a comment today that asked about that day and asked about the families who may not be able to take parent conference evenings. I did speak with that parent and I just wanna own up to that was great feedback that I needed to hear and that I did not consider when we were first looking through this, but I'm glad I heard it. I'm glad we heard it now because now we can do something. Now we can sit there and say, how do we make an adjustment, not change the day, but how do we ensure that we're still ensuring that all of those families, whether they need that for their you know, family time, for their to uh, take part in their religious ceremonies, um, how do we still ensure that they're still gonna have time to do parent conference. So I wanna to commit to speaking with Mr. Hicks, to connecting with our principals, and making sure that we have a plan for that. For in, I'll just say for instance, you know, it could be that we also want to ensure that October 9th, which is gonna be a student holiday, um, is a time that perhaps some families could also take part in parent-teacher conferences. But we want to commit to looking into that and coming back to that. And I'm glad that we got this feedback now and not a, a few days before September. And so we're gonna learn from that, come up with a plan. Um, because we're looking at removing the evenings, we'd also be looking at removing the early releases. So we would remove the October 6, 2023 early release. Um, currently, we have a staff PD scheduled for October 13th and November 7th. The October 13th would move to October 9th in recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day. The November 7th is um, our election day commitment. And as most of you know, and I know that, that we're all strong voters, but this is an off year election. It's gonna be constitutional amendments on there. And um, part of the reason why we wanted to take election day off was to ensure that our schools were safe places and then also to increase civic engagement for all of our staff. But number one was to ensure that our schools were safe places as voting locations. Well, in these types of elections, our schools are typically not used as voting locations because they don't need as many sites, because they don't expect as many voters. So we think that for this year, it being an off election year, we could move that day and we would like to move it to November 13th in recognition of Diwali. Uh, moving into our next semester, same thing I said before with the parent-teacher conference evening, changing that to a single day. It would be uh, the same elementary parent conference day, secondary professional development day, student holiday on Friday, February 9th. Uh, again, we'd remove the February 16th, 2024 early release day. And then the last thing that I heard, especially when I met with teachers, uh, because they, they were asking me, like, what, is, what does the law allow for professional development during the year? And I'd explain. And they said, well, if we have opportunity to take more days and it meets with our minutes and it meets with our days, we should look at taking more days. So we wanna actually add a brand new staff development student holiday, which would be April 10th, 2024, which would be in recognition of, uh, of Eid, uh, uh, Eid El Fitter. And so that would be uh, a brand new day that was not already on there. So here's how it kind of breaks down what you see in red on this breakdown is how many days we have right now in the calendar. And if nothing changes, that's where it stands. Um, so for first semester, we have 82.5 days in the semester. This change would make it 84. Second semester, we have 91 days. This change would make it 89. The reason I wanna highlight that is because you see that it's actually getting us a little bit closer to balance between those two semesters. Um, the changes here that we're proposing have no change to the first day or the last day of instruction, and it also does not have a change to winter break. Um, we did hear some feedback about that leading up. We heard some concerns that it was difficult to make travel plans. Um, the other concern that I heard that I really wanna highlight, because I think it's a very good concern that we need to consider, is that some families who had custodial orders, it was difficult for them with that switch because their custodial orders are set on days. It says that as of this day, here's where you know, the, the children go to the non-custodial parent or the custodial parent. And they switch each year. They go back and forth in odd and even years. So for this year, it was possible that for one parent, they actually last year got a shortened time frame. And then this year, because we switched when our winter break was, they got a shortened time frame again. Um, you know, that was something that, you know, we needed to consider and we did not when we made the change. Um, but it does switch back every year. So for those that had a shortened time frame this year, next year it would be a longer time frame. But I thought that was really good um, feedback that we got that we needed to listen to and we needed to understand and acknowledge. Um, the other feedback that we heard is that for families, and this wasn't as often, but for families who had kids in more than one district, it was difficult when one district had one holiday schedule and another district had another holiday schedule. We, we certainly understand that. Um, but we also heard after the break was over, a lot of good feedback 
um, from families and, and staff alike, that they enjoyed that time of not coming back right after New Year's Eve and having some additional time. Um, so we were really excited to hear that. Um, and so we are not proposing a change tonight to the winter break. Uh, last thing I would say is uh, I was asked by a few people, well, what does this mean for instructional minutes? And you should always share that. So I wanted to highlight and I want to put it on the calendar going forward. This would provide us 76,950 instructional minutes. High school is slightly different because they do early releases on exams. So they would have 75,670. Um, and that's just slightly more than what we're required to have of 75,600. But it does meet the requirements from the state. Uh, and I also wanted to make a commitment, especially for Trustee Boswell and for our Austin High community, um, that we want to continue to work with them, recognizing that ACL creates a logistical concern that is unique to, that is unlike, I, I've been there on that day. It is very unique. It is very difficult. We are committed to working with them since that early release day was removed um, to see how we can still support the Austin High Campus on that day and that they still get their minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I have um, just some concerns that were brought up. Again, you hear a lot with 28 schools, right? That's, that's from Blanton to Andrews. It's all kinds of different families. For me, I had a great time. I didn't have to wake up, didn't have to feed anybody. But I also, my children can stay home by themselves. So, and I work from home. It wasn't a problem for me. But if I worked a job and I had to be back on the third, that meant I had to find somebody or pay somebody to keep my kid. And maybe I didn't have that money. So that's the, the downside of it. The good side of it is that teachers actually had time to do stuff and not take off work, right? Because normally it's the, they finish the holidays and they have to go back to work. This, um, but then the downside for them is that they get the one day stuffed with all that stuff. Like, and in case you don't know, all we want to do is be in our rooms. <laughs> that's all we want. Give us our keys and let us be in our rooms. And so I don't know if the district has planned to, since we pretty much have the same, I'm looking at 2021, 21, 22, we only had nine days off, and then 22, 23, and 23, 24, it's 10 days. That's good. But they came back on the 9th this year, and they'll come back on the 8th in 24. In our planning and all of the stuff that we do all year long, is there any way to give teachers some time that day? Like, do they have to, you know, spend every single minute in some kind of professional development, or can we do, like, a morning and an afternoon? I mean, that's for the academic department to think about. I don't need to answer today. I just want to know if it's possible to give them back some of their time. Yeah, right? yeah so to be clear, the 8th would be a staff, staff mm -hmm. professional development mm -hmm. day, student holiday. The answer to your question is, is that yes. Um, there are some requirements if we want to utilize the TEA waiver mm -hmm. for professional development where we have to ensure that it meets their requirements and we have to ensure that everyone signs in. Um, but we've built a schedule to where we have our maximum number of PD days, so I could use another day. Um, so there, there's flexibility to the answer of your question. I would love to speak um, with Mr. Hicks in a little bit more detail on that so that we can talk about what, it, what, what can be on that day and speak with our interim superintendent. But the quick answer to your question is that yes, that is a possibility. And then also the good news for 23-24 is that if a parent did have to go back on the second or the third, they only have to make it through Thursday, Friday, and Monday. So they, it's less than a whole week. It's only three days. So teachers are still getting more time. Parents are having less time they have to find. So next year's schedule looks a little bit better for, for both groups. And I, it's a happy medium for me. Um, and... Mm. And Trustee Hunter, if, if I may, yes. you know, also we recognize that since it's really just shifting for our families who weren't able to take off time in December leading up to Christmas, that's now, right? but I get it. I, any, I understand how a change is something that we need to work with and that we, we as a district need to be really good at sharing out what we're doing, why we are doing it, um, and getting it out there early, not waiting until it's four days beforehand and say, oh, don't forget, we're off in two days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Trustee Lugo. We like to talk. God, I'm trying not to. Um, so yeah, I do wanna just uh, reiterate um, the thing about being at home three weeks because I have a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a 12-year-old. And thank God I get to work from home. Like I'm very privileged. I recognize that um, that's a long time with three children. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. So I'm looking forward to the new and improved calendar for the coming years. Um, the other thing I wanted to say isn't 
is not directly related to the minutes or the days. It's actually a kudos for the cafeteria folks because, dude, I didn't have to make lunch all week. Do you know how do you know how important this is? This is huge. No lunches for these children. They could just eat at school and they liked what they that what was on the menu every single day. That was huge. That's a time saver. So thank you. Love that. Trustee Kaufman. Um, thank you first for kind of revisiting what could be done to honor Yom Kippur and how to make sure that works. Um, Thank you additionally for considering the feedback from people about the winter holiday. Um, I too heard a lot of concern prior to it and a lot of joy afterwards. Um, but I do wonder about kind of the systematic way of gathering community and employee input into our calendar decisions. Because I've heard ant anecdotally about people's positive things to that, but I don't know what the, you know, what people think widely about those. And I know traditionally we've had a lot more, and I've heard that you made the commitment to to returning to more engagement in our planning process for the calendar so that we can get that input. But in this case, like, can we, you know, maybe it's too late for that this year, but I just want to re, um, mm -hmm. reinstitute that process of really engaging the community and making these decisions. Um, I also want to echo what Trustee Hunter said about the planning and prep day um, and the importance of that for teachers um, when they come back that day. That's just a lot to come back from vacation and have a full week of classes immediately upon, or even four days of classes immediately upon return. So finding a way to, in, to incorporate some planning and prep time for that as well. Um, and then I also, <clears throat> this is twice now that we've kind of made some significant calendar changes, either mid-year or right after the calendar has already been adopted. Uh, I just wonder whether we might want to consider in the future a process that would um, adopt the start day and the end day and maybe the winter holiday and maybe Thanksgiving, but not adopt a full calendar prior to January of the year before so mm -hmm. that all these kind of details around which are the specific little holidays and where the PD days are, we're not taking an adopted printed calendar and changing it a lot. And that leaves us some more space to get input and feedback and respond to how last year's calendar worked before we you know, adopt yeah. a calendar. That's just a recommendation. Thank you, Trustee Kaufman. Any other comments? Thank you. Uh, I just want to go on the record. I did not ask for Diwali, to the holiday, but I, I just, I, I didn't ask for it, but I'm happy to see it there. But at the same time, like, I'm like, but I love voting just as much as I love Diwali. So now I'm a little torn. So if y'all don't, like, and I, I, I told some of my Indian friends about this this weekend. I was like, y'all, ASC is thinking about doing this. And they were like, but Diwali's on Sunday. <laughs> we don't need that day. So anyway, all of this is to say, if y'all really want to have election day off, like I personally, my Indian friends are going to get mad at me, but I personally would be okay with that. <laughs> but because there are, there are years that Diwali is like on a Wednesday and we're like, not like that would be really helpful to have that day off. But then that's like random day in the middle of the week. But anyway, I just wanted to say that I appreciate it. And, um, you know, but I also recognize that voting day, election day is a holiday in our district. We sign. So like, if, like, I won't be offended if anybody wants to have a discussion about that. So. Anyway, so um, thank you, Dr. Reach. And applications are open for the calendar task force for next year. We're going to start in September. Website yeah. is already posted. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so this will end our um, regular agenda preview. Uh, so we'll now recess the open meeting at 10.05 p.m and move to exec session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551.074, 551.072, 551.073, 551.087, 551.076, and 551.071. So for our viewers at home, this concludes our live broadcast. When we are finished with the exec session, we will briefly return to open session to formally adjourn the meeting. The adjournment will be recorded and be included in all replays of tonight's meetings. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.